Great, we are recording now. So uh, greetings everyone. I am Nate Angel from Hypothesis um, and I have some other Hypothesis colleagues with me here too. But before we um, get started with that, I wanted to um, make sure that everybody had the program for today in front of them. Um, and this is gonna also evolve a little bit as we move along. Uh, just get the link for that here. So we've got two documents that we'll be focusing on today. Um, this one that I'm putting uh, the link into chat there has the, uh, has the agenda. So if you wanna take a look at that and then um, I'll also put a link to uh, Jeremy's presentation in there. Sorry, I didn't have that already, oops. Um, and I'd like to, um, as people kind of get situated and come into the room, so we've got three hours together today. Um, we've got some breaks scheduled in. Um, there's gonna be some interactivity, some discussion, some annotation. Uh, let me just share my screen here so that you can Get situated. Sorry, it's very early here on the uh, west coast of the United States, 7 a.m. I realize it's maybe not that early. I see Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Greetings. Good to see you again. So um, this is the document that I put the first link into chat in there. Um, and I will, uh, I will add it one more time in case there's uh, people who are just arriving. Um, but it has the program on it. And I just wanted to give you an idea of how the day is gonna go here. Get the chat going. So one thing um, that we might start out with is um, I see people are already introducing themselves and talking about uh, where they're located uh, in the chat. That's great, let's do that. So we all um, get to know each other a little bit. Um, and uh, can you confirm for me, Franny, if, uh, are you able to see the other participants list? Um, yes. Okay, great. So we can actually see who's in the room. Let me move this out of the way here. Okay. So um, we're just, uh, and I'll introduce folks in just a second, but um, we're gonna, uh, this is the program. We're gonna start off with this kind of getting on the same page um, that will cover some of the material that we talked about on Wednesday, but go a little bit deeper. And my colleague, Jeremy Dean is gonna do that. Then we're gonna move into a demo uh, of hypothesis in Sakai, uh, right in the tri-Sakai environment that, um, that Longsight uh, has generously contributed to this, uh, this conference. Thank you, Longsight. Uh, we're going to take a little break then, and then we're going to get into something where uh, folks who in the community are going to talk with you a little bit about experiences that they've had um, with annotation or plans that they are making for annotation or ideas they have for annotation. Uh, and we're going to kind of discuss that as a group, um, those, different, um, those different situations, those different experiences and plans. And then uh, take another break, and then we're going to come back at the end for a um, interactive collaborative annotation experience, if you will. Um, and we're actually gonna focus in on some of the material from your keynote speaker, Kathleen Fitzpatrick. So um, uh, hopefully uh, a fun and exciting day for everyone. I know uh, if you can't stay for all of it, that's fine. Um, feel free to dip in and out. Um, that's great, we don't mind that at all. We won't be insulted. We know people have other things to do. So, um, if there aren't other kind of uh, housekeeping or logistics questions, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, I would like to introduce um, my colleague, Jeremy Dean, Dr. Jeremy Dean, actually, who I call the Dean of Collaborative Ad, uh, Annotation. Um, he, and uh, Jeremy is gonna start things off um, with a uh, little bit of talking with you about uh, hypothesis and social annotation. Greetings, Jeremy. 
Hey, Nate, can I steal the screen from you? Yes, you can. And I will also make you a co-host. Sorry, I should have done that before. Hey everybody, uh, really excited to be here. I wish we could all be together in, uh, in Ann Arbor, but um, it's good that we're being safe, but I'm glad we can still connect in some way. Um, and I hope we can make it a, a substantive connection here through Zoom and, and through some annotation exercises. I'm Jeremy Dean, I'm Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. I'm gonna give a little background on annotation and collaborative annotation um, before we uh, hop into a demo in Sakai. Um, this deck is available to you at uh, Hype Aperio. Um, and I'll just jump in here. Um, I usually present to faculty and instructional designers and instructional leaders at schools. So you'll see that my, my uh, presentation is sort of aimed at those kind of folks. Some, you may be those kinds of folks yourselves. You may be in other roles at, at universities and organizations. Um, obviously been talking to a lot of faculty lately about remote learning, uh, folks that are not used to remote learning, that are new to remote learning. Um, and I've tried to, uh, calm folks nerves by sharing this quote um, that's a quote from a while ago uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education talking about social annotation or social reading technologies like hypothesis um, and I, I share it thinking about the spaces that we lose when we um, you know move to remote teaching um, the spaces that some of us may be accustomed to you know performing our teaching and learning in like the classroom um, and just reminding folks that there are authentic places to engage with uh, instructors and teachers, for instructors and teach, uh, and students to engage with each other uh, online. I think annotation is one of them. Online, a book, but really any document, an article, um, can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. Uh, my, uh, so just a little bit about hypothesis. I think um, we have a kinship with the Open Aperio community and the Sakai community. Um, we're an open uh, source uh, software company. We build annotation according to open standards. So I think there's a real kinship in, this, in the thinking around uh, education software and how it should be developed to be open and interoperable. Um, and our focus is on annotation as it interoperates with uh, various learning environments and, and uh, platforms. And here's a little glimpse. You can see Nate in the upper left-hand corner. Franny uh, is also here with us today from Hypothesis. Um, I, I'm an English professor by training. Uh, and I, long before I started experimenting with digital tools in the classroom, would hand out a poem by Billy Collins called Marginalia to my students on day one. Uh, it's an ode to annotation. I'd hand it out, you know, I'd print out the syllabus and this poem on day one, um, really because I believed that annotation uh, was going to be fundamental to my students' success uh, in my course. It had been part of my success as a student and as a scholar, a critical practice um, that I practiced every day as part of my work. Um, and I wanted them to do it. And so I handed this poem out as inspiration. Uh, this is a, just an excerpt. We have all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show. We did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed a thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. Um, many of you will recognize this sort of uh, uh, relating to active learning, right? Not a new concept for those of us in education. Um, but I do, and, and so, you know, active reading has always been part of the goal of, of annotation practices. Um, and again, this was nothing new or radical in my pedagogy to suggest that my students annotate. Annotation has been around for a very, very long time, practiced by students and scholars since probably before the invention of the book. Um, but as we start to deliver more content online, uh, we lose the space, we lose the margin uh, where we practice this critical literacy skill. Um, and part of what Hypothesis does, uh, it hopes to do, is to bring the margin back, to revive the margin, if you will, um, in online reading, um, to counteract some of the research that we know, um, or the findings of some research that we know that says that, you know, when students read online, they're not retaining as much, they're not as engaged as much, and we want to, uh, you know, have them be engaged and, and, uh, and retaining and, and developing critical thinking skills in relationship to, ship to their reading, as they might have done in analog annotation with digital annotation. Um, and so we're bringing back that marginal uh, private note layer, but there's also other things that we can do in the margin in a sort of digital networked environment. Um, we can have that layer of private notes. There can also be a public layer of commentary in the form of annotation. Uh, this is actually disabled in our LMS integration uh, for privacy reasons. 
Um, but we are not just an ed tech company. We build annotation software for all kinds of professions and use cases. Um, and the public layer is an important one in terms of commentary on the web. It's actually really where Hypothesis originated was in developing that public layer of commentary in the form of annotation on the web. Um, a great example of this is the Washington Post has adopted Hypothesis uh, to annotate primary source documents from the news. So if you Google Wash Po Obama Biden endorsement, um, you'll see where they launched that project and you can see uh, Washington Post journalists annotating uh, Obama's endorsement uh, with commentary and they've done that several times since, since then. Um, but I think most important for the education context uh, is the ability to create circumscribed uh, private communities of annotation and reading with hypothesis. So you can have a group of colleagues maybe at your institution or a group of colleagues uh, across an institution in your in your specialization across institutions um, and of course private groups for your uh, individual courses a private group for every section that you teach in a particular semester and private groups for every semester uh, as you move forward. I want to share three top level takeaways that we've uh, gleaned from our from feedback from students and instructors using the tool. And the first one relates to that sort of tried and true, uh, you know, logic of why folks annotate and why it's important to have uh, to, to, to annotate. Um, and that's that, you know, annotation makes reading visible. Um, and uh, this is a quote from Larry Hanley just talking about, you know, how uh, annotation made his students more careful, engaged readers. Um, but this slide actually shows something I think that's important to think about as you think about annotation uh, online, which is that how we are active as students and teachers in annotation um, is, is expanded when we annotate online. Because with Hypothesis, you can use images and videos and links and other multimedia elements as part of your annotation. And so you can see in this screenshot, sort of accidentally, that a student has used a meme um, to comment on Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem. So I often talk to teachers about thinking about visual rhetoric and visual argumentation and multimedia composition as they uh, talk to their students about uh, annotation. This one I think is especially new and, and part of what excites me the most about uh, collaborative annotation um, and, and possibly you know, the expanding research around collaborative annotation and its efficacy in education. When I handed out that poem by Billy Collins, it was really completely aspirational, right? I would hand out the poem, say you should annotate and then proceeded with the course and really graded my students' final products, written final products um, for you know, skills that they had, should have been practicing from, from day one. That is to say, I didn't teach them how to annotate, I didn't tell them how to you know, deliberately select text and what kinds of annotations to put in the margins. I didn't talk to them about adding to those annotations in class discussion. I didn't talk to them about harvesting those annotations as part of their uh, paper writing process. I just graded the final product. Um, and annotation, collaborative annotation makes reading visible. It makes a lot of processes visible that I think, um, at least in my teaching, I didn't have access to uh, guide my students and intervene if my students needed intervention. Um, so this idea of making those processes, specifically reading and its you know, annotation and all the sort of corollary uh, skills and practices related to that um, visible is really powerful. Uh, it can be used as a sort of uh, reading compliance tool to make sure that your students have read, right? That's I, I know as a teacher that there have been times I've looked out over my uh, students in the classroom and, and wondered, did, did they do the reading or did that person do the reading? Well, this allows you a little bit more insight to who, you know, cracked the, the digital spine as it were um, and, and put some footprints along the text. Um, but it's also, I think more importantly, you know, rather than compliance, a question of visibility into where your students were confused in the reading. Uh, visibility into where your students were excited or a particular student was excited and nurturing a particular line of inquiry or intervening in a, in a particular confusion. Um, but also one of the more powerful things about that is not just the teacher's presence and the ability to be to see their students engagement, um, but students being uh, there for each other. The number one thing that students say every single semester for the past five years since I surveyed them after using hypothesis in the classroom is that they learn from their peers. That was the number, that's always the number one takeaway. Um, and I think it's a very powerful thing to have your peers working through text with you. I know I wish I had this when I was in grad school, reading Derrida and thinking what, you know, WTF is this guy talking about? Um, and knowing that other people were probably thinking the same thing uh, and working with them to decipher the difficult language and concepts. Um, this is part of the experience of reading in college, I think, is being uh, shocked in a way by the difficulty of the kinds of reading that one does um, 
in college. And it's, it's nice not to be alone. It's nice to work through that together. Um, and this is just remains one of my favorite quotes from a student about hypothesis. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. Does anybody need an explanation of what Facebook is? I don't know that people use it anymore. Um, well, you can probably Google it and find out. Uh, but hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone understand this? Am I crazy with this brilliant tool? I know I'm not alone. So uh, I'm just now going to move into the demo sec uh, section of this uh, discussion or this presentation. Uh, when hypothesis is active on a text, and we do have a Sakai uh, LTI integration, um, when hypothesis is active on a text, you can select text to annotate, uh, reply to an existing annotation. This is something I always emphasize in talking to instructors, the idea or the fact that there's a reply button and uh, guiding students to be discursive in their annotation. It's not always the case that that's the goal of an annotation assignment, but uh, certainly in my field in English and literary studies, the goal is often discussion. Um, but hypothesis is a very flexible tool, right? We try not to be, to mandate certain pedagogical uses for, uh, for annotation and make it a flexible space. Uh, and then of course, as I've said before, you can annotate together in groups. There are some uh, resources in this slide deck. Uh, if you're in a position to turn around and, and implement annotation uh, as part of your platform or at your organization, um, there's some basic uh, resources here uh, just about thinking through introducing annotation to students or a community. Um, and then of course we have a Sakai installation, which Nate will demo from in just a minute. Um, it essentially allows you to make your, uh, your readings annotatable and has all the benefits of an LTI integration in terms of single sign on and, and groupings of students and things like that. Um, and then uh, it also has the ability to uh, allow teachers to um, grade annotation sets. Um, and for me, this is part of that idea of making reading visible, right? Um, I can see how Lucy read valediction and give her feedback or give her a grade and give her feedback on how you know, her reading practices, whatever they might be um, as part of, uh, of my course, right? <clears throat> and I get to set those, uh, those goals and expectations as part of the course. So you can see here um, in the screenshot, there's a little grading uh, toolbar at the top that would be visible just to a teacher. Um, that allows them to cycle through their students one by one and just see an individual student's contributions to a larger conversation. Um, or they can view the larger conversation, you know, and uh, as a whole and, and interact with that, but they also have this other sort of student by student view. Um, and for those completely new to hypothesis, this little sidebar um, over here is what is hypothesis. And you can see annotations in this one and we'll, we'll pop into a demo uh, real quick. Um, and there are some Sakai resources and we're building them out. The actual the access to the long site uh, instance uh, to demo here for this conference has been invaluable actually for our own uh, research around the, our own Sakai implementation, just because we don't have our own Sakai incidents. It's been uh, prohibitive for us to, to get our own. Uh, we have Sakai partners like UNC and UVA um, that have been really helpful in um, you know, understanding the Sakai implementation and working together to get it up and running and it is up and running, but we don't have as much of a testing environment uh, as we do with other LMSs. And uh, we've taken advantage of the long site access to, to, to build out our knowledge base and things like that. Um, Nate, I can jump into my provocations for annotation ahead of the demo. Does that sound right uh, to have a yeah. yeah, let's go ahead and um you know, stick with this and then we'll get into a more detailed demo and playing around in Sakaya in a bit. All right. Well, I'm going to pause and take a sip of coffee uh, I'd love to do that. ahead of my pedagogical uh, um, uh, provocations here um, and just see if there are any questions. And you're welcome to un unmute um, and you're also welcome to uh, uh, ask in the chat, but I'm going to, I'm going to sip my coffee now. Sipping. Everybody watch as Jeremy caffeinates. Well done. It's all about self-care, right? He's going to take two sips even. I'm also <clears throat> coffee, so cheers. So as I said, I'm, I'm often um, presenting to faculty and structural designers. Um, and so this is really directed at folks like that. Um, but I am going to offer sort of five ways to think about how to use annotation in the classroom. Uh, Nate and I, as, as literary fools, as it were, a lot of our um, examples are like reading poems and, you know, close reading poems. Um, and, uh, and there's other ways to annotate besides such stodgy, you know, uh, 
humanities type applications. Um, we'll do the demo in a second, Charles, but it's always through the lessons tool currently in Sakai. Um, we always go through lessons, but there's a, t a tie to the gradebook there. Um, so some ways to think about annotation. Uh, the first is that it may not be about reading and close reading as much as uh, Nate and I suggested, right? And, and annotating these, you know, century old poems and, 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 and close reading them. Um, I get feedback quite often from students and teachers that really what they got out of Hypothesis was a sense of community uh, in the classroom. Um, I had a history professor at UT Austin, I'm based here in, in Texas. Um, and, and, uh, and she said, you know, she saw students using Hypothesis and then they turned to other group work and were just primed for collaboration. Um, so it's a powerful tool for developing collaboration skills and a sense of community, which of course today, if you're turning around and facing the prospect of more remote learning at your institution, um, is invaluable, right? And there was a great uh, piece of feedback from a student this year, actually in Armenia, using a hypothesis as part of a course that said, you know, she really missed not being able to go into the classroom with her, with her classmates during the pandemic, but hypothesis really helped her feel like she was still close to them and still working with them, um, which is great. Um, annotate your syllabus. This is an idea stolen uh, from, from Rami Kalir, uh, but the idea that, you know, uh, any, course objects, even if they're, or artifacts, even if they're not, um, you know, formal published work that people are analyzing, um, can be annotated, um, and for different reasons, right? I mean, for one thing, annotating your syllabus is a great way to introduce the tool um, and gets folks used to using the tool. Um, but annotating your syllabus also can help clear up any confusions or, or understand better where students are coming from. Like, have you read any of this material before? Are you particularly scared or excited about any of the material or are you confused by anything that's on the syllabus? Um, it's a great way to have that kind of meta conversation about your course um, that you might normally have face-to-face -face, um, and you might not be able to have face-to-face -face, uh, this time around. Um, but in any case, it's also just a great way to think about your course as a collaborative effort with your students, that you're not just delivering something to them that they're receiving, um, but that they have some input into it. Um, every time I talk to students and teachers using hypothesis, I learn a new way, that, a, a, new, a new use case, as it were. Um, it's possible just to turn annotation on top, uh, on, on top of the readings for a course so that we have the margin back um, and students may use it in ways that we, we don't expect. Um, of course, you can also be more guided in how you introduce annotation uh, to, to your students and to a course. Um, and you can, if you want, just be the guide. We see this at lower levels of education, like middle school and high school more often, where a teacher will essentially gloss a text for their students. Um, but a teacher can also go in and create prompts, right? One way to think about hypothesis as, is as an alternative or a supplement to um, a discussion forum, right? Like page bottom comments on, on web articles that kind of can spin away from <laughs> the subject matter into some scary uh, places. Um, and maybe it's just the English teacher in me, but I want the conversation rooted in the text. I want everything really coming back to the text. And I've learned from partners in the in, uh, health professional fields and, and others that, you know, most disciplines really want students to stick to the text and ground claims in text. Um, and so uh, prompts, you know, having prompts inside of, hypo uh, inside of the readings that you uh, put for your students is another way to think about more um, grounded discussion forums um, that, are, that are adjacent to the text. Um, the bread and butter, though, of Hypothesis really is the ability to have seminar-style discussion asynchronously online. Um, it was my fantasy when I went to grad school that I would be doing what, what this gentleman is doing, sitting on a quad in some sunny place um, and, you know, reading aloud with students and talking about the reading. Um, turns out that's not why you go to English grad school. I don't know if anybody's planning to do that, but uh, not what they train you to do exactly. Um, but I still think this is part of what we do as teaching, even if we don't have a quad like this, that we're, you know, we have the book out if we're, uh, and we're, we're talking about particular passages. Um, and, and this is a way to do that asynchronously online, um, which I think is especially invaluable in this COVID moment. But really, uh, you know, even before COVID, instructors gave us feedback that having this sort of asynchronous discussion uh, ahead of class really enhanced class discussion. Um, and, and in one way sort of accelerated class discussion um, in the sense that uh, I might have to start off with some banter and some sort of 
you know, low level conversation, like, did you do the reading? Like, how far did you get? Uh, what did people think of it? You know, and you really jump into being able to say, Franny, your comment on page three had a lot of uh, people responding. Like, uh, do you want to respond to the responses as is part of class discussion? So you can begin with that artifact um, and point to it. And I think that's especially helpful in these awkward Zoom sessions uh, where really I can only see that um, I do still see that Nate's paying attention, but the rest of you may have popped off because for all I know. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, um, you know, it's not just for those smaller classes, um, but uh, you can annotate any artifact that can be turned into a PDF. So it could be lecture notes or a slide deck. Um, if it has optical character recognition, that could be an artifact for annotation and help students. Um, and uh, and uh, work through that material, raise, raise questions and, and such. Um, I think that's the final thing. I, I guess the last thing I'll say is just a little pitch for the pilot, which coincidentally people are talking about in the, uh, in the other margin here, the chat. Uh, thanks for, for that, Josh. You can also use your emojis. I, re I realized recently that um, in, a, in a talk I gave that it, it's nice when people do the little emoji and like do the hand clap or the thumbs up. That's another way, thank you, Nate. Um, to let me know that you're still there uh, without unmuting if that's uh, scary. Um, so yeah, there's a pilot program. We have Sakai schools in our pilot. I, I uh, moved through so many different learning management systems that sometimes I forget who's who in those, but uh, uh, UVA is piloting and UNC Chapel Hill is piloting. I know those are Sakai schools. I think there are a few more. There are several uh, Sakai schools that are um, in negotiations to pilot. So um, we have this pilot program. Uh, a lot of schools, maybe you see yours here, maybe you see other Sakai schools here. Uh, this is actually a little dated. I think we need to update it more um, because we're getting quite a few schools signing up to pilot, um, especially uh, post COVID preparing for, um, for more remote education. Um, we obviously offer full technical support uh, as part of the uh, pilot program, uh, the full integration in Sakai or, or another LMS if, if you're using another LMS. Um, we've got a great knowledge base. I can see that my colleague Michael, who manages the knowledge base and manages support, is, is on the call. So hi, Michael. Great knowledge base, but also great support in Michael um, and his team. Um, very responsive to users and, and pilot uh, schools are prioritized in our queue for support. Um, but we also have pedagogical support. Uh, I've done a lot of hiring over the past six months, and, and it's been a, a, a criteria that everybody that I hire has some you know, substantial background in education, either teaching high school or admin, uh, being an administrator in high school or in college. So we have instructional designer, former instructional designers on our team. In fact, we stole somebody from Lucy at NYU, uh, who's our, now our product manager. Um, but everybody from sales to success has a background in education and is, is as capable of talking about the tech, technology of collaborative annotation as the pedagogy. And that's super important. Obviously, I have, a, as I said, a PhD in English and a background in education. And, Best part of my job is definitely talking about the pedagogy of this tool um, and uh, always learning from our, our partners in, uh, in the pilot program about new ways that uh, annotation can be used uh, for teaching and learning. Um, and we are very white glove in the sense that we offer, hey, if, you want to if you're a biology professor and you don't know how to implement this and you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one session to talk about the possibilities, you can schedule time with us if you're part of the pilot program. Um, and then we also have, you know, Nate does a phenomenal job of building community around annotation. Um, and he's created this annotate ed community, which this is really an event, uh, a part, you know, this event is part of that. Um, but we work in a lot of different ways to bring folks together, uh, whether it's, you know, instructional designers uh, across institutions talking about uh, best practices or instructors in a particular discipline talking about the application in their field. Um, or even administrators and, uh, and people in purchasing at universities talking about best pricing models <laughs> uh, for these kinds of technologies and te te technologists um, in, in, uh, in, 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 at schools talking about interoperability, right? We've had some conversations with others in the Sakai community before about ways in which hypothesis can be more integrated specifically into Sakai to deliver some more, uh, some additional features like peer review um, and things like that, or perhaps um, using hypothesis as a way to kind of bring a canvas speed grader like experience to the grading in Sakai. So I think there's, there's great potential for collaboration here, technically, pedagogically, um, and specifically grounded in, uh, in Sakai and its principles and, and, and technology. And that's it for me. I think, um, 
I hope your the creative juices are flowing. You're thinking about ways that uh, cloud orientation can be useful to you and and your colleagues, maybe for professional development, but also um, if you if you teach at an education work in an educational institution about how it can be implemented uh, in the classroom. And we'll look closely now at the Sakai implementation. Hey, greetings, folks. Um, thank you for that, Jeremy. Uh, that was great. That was exactly what I was hoping uh, folks would get a chance to think about was some of the kind of pedagogical applications. And of course, we got a lot of we got a lot of different kinds of folks in the room. I think um, we have technologists, we have teachers, we have teachers who are also administrators <laughs> and administrators who are also teachers and technologists um, all over the map. And so one thing that I'm really hoping that we'll do uh, today, and sorry, my camera, I keep having to adjust it to see the chat. Um, I'm like falling off the screen here. But one thing that I'm hoping that we'll really do today is um, kind of open up for some uh, kind of discussion and exploration around how things could be imagined in Sakai. Because I don't know, not everybody may know this, but I used to be uh, really involved in the Sakai community and I've drifted away. It's my fault. I'm sorry for that. But one thing that I know about the Aperio and Sakai communities is that people are very hands on and engaged in helping to build their future themselves rather than waiting for some technology provider to do it. And so one thing that I'm hoping that we'll be able to do today is um, is uh, do some of that kind of preliminary exploration and discussion here in this session, which will start at, yes, 11 Eastern, Ellen. Um, so uh, we're, that's when we'll move into this sort of more uh, discussion and collaboration oriented section. Um, what we had planned next was to move over and look at um, the demo site that we've got set up in, in uh, the Tri-Sakai environment. Um, and uh, just a couple of things about that before we, we get started. Um, as Jeremy has sort of mentioned here, there's um, a couple of different uh, things going on <laughs> or ways in which one can use Sakai. And Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'll, I'll probably share my screen in just a second. Um, whoa, so many people. I can't believe that we had uh, actually uh, 43 show up. Uh, greetings to everybody who may have come in late. Um, hey, Franny, would you mind putting the link to the uh, program document in the um, chat again, just in case there's latecomers who didn't get that? Uh, so one, oh, sorry, what, did you want to say something? No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I did promise that I would introduce Franny, uh, so I will do, I will take a moment to do that now. So um, Franny is an, another member of the team here at um, Hypothesis, um, a re relatively recent join. Uh, uh, Franny, would you like to just say hi and introduce yourself and tell us where you're calling from? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I am calling from Portland, Oregon, and um, I am very happy to be here. It's so interesting. and. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I'm shy today. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, nobody's required to have their camera on. And then um, I'm also, we're also joined here by our colleague, um, Michael. Michael, did you wanna uh, say hi to folks? He may be busy. Sure, uh, sorry, yeah, hi there we all. Go. I'm here, I, I don't know that I dressed for success today, so I'm gonna leave my, my video off. <laughs> But, Where are uh, you calling in from, Michael? I'm in Ithaca, New York. Sunny Ithaca. Ah, yes. And yeah. that's one thing to know about the Sakai team is we are distributed all over the world, actually. We have folks all the way from the UK to California. Um, and so we don't even have a headquarters or anything. We're just kind of spread out all over the world, as you guys are as well. Um, so, uh, and I'm just checking to see if there are any other hypothesizers here in the, in the crowd yet to, that you might want to meet. Um, so, uh, before we um, jump into looking at um, hypothesis in Sakai, I wanted to um, address something about different ways that it can be used um, as a tool. Um, and we, we often think of these as a kind of annotation in the wild, kind of on the open web, and then annotation inside the LMS. Um, so inside something like Sakai, right, or any, actually any LMS that's learning tools interoperability compliant, um, as Sakai obviously forged the way there in the very beginning. Um, thanks, Dr. Chuck. It's got the obligatory Dr. Chuck, thank you. Um, and so uh, I wanted to, uh, in case people end up 
getting confused at all, I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit about these two uh, modes in which you can use hypothesis. So um, if you go to the hypothesis websites, um, and I'll put in the main link here, to this start page, you'll see that you can use that as an environment where you can equip your browser with Hypothesis. You can set up a free account and equip your, your browser with Hypothesis and start to use it in the wild on the open web. And this is, um, this is sort of like the basic kind of individual use um, for Sakai in the sense that you can kind of equip yourself to annotate any digital document that you encounter in your travels through the web. Um, it is also possible to do group oriented work in this in the wild environment. You can actually establish a private group and have people create hypothesis accounts and then join your private group and so forth. So it is possible to use hypothesis um, in a variety of different educational modes, just like Jeremy was suggesting in this in the wild mode. Uh, but uh, I'm using mode too many different times there, but uh, we, we know that that's a lot of friction though for a lot of people, right? It's, it's sometimes <laughs> to hurt, if you've got a class of even you know, 12 people, right? And you wanna have them all create accounts and join a special private group and go to a link and then always remember to annotate privately instead of publicly if you're, if you're wanting them to work in a private mode. Um, it, there could be a lot of friction with that. And so a lot of folks wanted us uh, to um, provide a different experience that sort of had more scaffolding around it. And that's why we worked to create the, this LTI integration um, that works with Sakai and others. So the, the way that Hypothesis works inside the LMS is a little bit different in the sense that, first of all, there's single sign-on with the LMS, right? So if you are authenticated to the LMS, you are also uh, uh, automatically given a, a, an account in Hypothesis and and signed into that sort of behind the scenes um, without even knowing what's going on. Um, and then the second thing is when Hypothesis is deployed in a course shell or a course site, if you would use the Sakai, Sakai terminology, um, that roster of folks involved in that uh, course site, or it could be a program site in Sakai's case, are automatically gonna be annotating in a private group that's created also automatically behind the scenes. And so what, it, what the LMS integration does is, is it provides this kind of much easier way to bring a group of people into a, a, a private annotation experience, if you would, um, with each other, right? So they're annotating together as a group, but not out in public. But I wanted, because uh, so many folks in, um, in Skyland are interested in sort of like moments of open education and other kinds of experiences as well uh, inside the LMS, I wanted to make it clear that there are these two different modes. And as we explore uh, the integration with Sakai today, I think there will be times when we'll also think about how the in the wild experience can be um, sort of activated, maybe even inside the, the Sakai environment as well. So um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different possibilities here. But I wanted to start things out by um, uh, I wanted to start things out by just kind of showing off the basic LTI integration in Sakai and then invite you guys all in to play around with it. So um, you'll see uh, in the demo section of the program, um, and Franny had just put the program link back there in the chat, um, uh, you'll see that there is a link to a Sakai site, a try Sakai site, and I'm just going to enable my own sharing again here. And I am going to go to it as well. So there is a link to this uh, Sakai site annotation 101. It's also publicly searchable in the Tri Sakai environment. So you can, um, you can just find it using the regular Sakai tools and join. And when you join, um, you'll automatically join as a student in the student role. Um, and you'll, I'll just taking a look at who's already in here. Um, and uh, I would be happy to promote anyone who wants to um, take over as an instructor at some point after I show, show you the ropes a little bit too. Um, uh, so that you can uh, play around with, with kind of the instructor role. 
um, some folks who were um, looking at it on Wednesday uh, already um, already were doing that as well. Uh, but I wanted to start things off just by showing you kind of uh, the the basic way that um, hypothesis can can integrate with Sakai in this LTI manner. And so, as was already starting to be discussed in the chat. Um, and let me just make sure I have the chat open in case anybody's saying anything there that uh, I should be aware of. Sorry, I'm just making sure everybody's okay. So, uh, Richard, when you say unable to log in, do you mean to the Trisakai site? There's a whole bunch of people uh, here who could probably help solve that if that's what the actual issue is. Um, yeah, Wilma, for example, who works at Longsite. Thank you, Wilma, for being here. Uh, so at any rate, I'll back to the demo experience. Um, so uh, the way that uh, Hypothesis uh, integrates uh, most clearly and easily, it's, it is an external tool, but we've integrated it with the, uh, the lessons tool, um, and that's the basic way that we think that um, it can most easily be used in the Sky environment today. We can explore other possibilities, as Alan was suggesting, um, uh, maybe today as, as the day moves on. Um, I've renamed lessons here Hypothesis just for fun, um, but this is the lessons tool under the hood. And you can see that um, Jeremy has, and I have added one too, we've already set up a couple of quote unquote assigned annotated readings here in the lessons tool. And so I'm just gonna open a couple of these and just show you what the mechanics of it look like um, inside, uh, inside the lessons tool. And then I'll actually demonstrate adding a new uh, assigned reading, if you will, to the lessons tool with hypothesis enabled so you can kind of see how that works. So um, uh, in his uh, earlier section there, uh, Jeremy was talking about Billy Collins' marginalia. And so um, th that is one of the uh, readings that he has brought into the environment here. And uh, as you all know better than I do, um, you can either, in lessons, you can either have the resource open up in the, the same window or you can have it open up in a new window. And we've, we've done it a couple different ways here. But you can see this is a, a, a public web version of, um, uh, of the poem, Marginalia by Billy Collins. And you can uh, see that the hypothesis sidebar is enabled here along the side and highlighted words would lead directly to, um, to the uh, annotations that are related to those words. Um, and so, uh, I would invite people, if you're going to be making annotations on any of these, to understand the context of how that's going to happen here. Because we brought this into a Sakai site, uh, we're annotating in the context of a private group that is linked to this Hypothesis Annotation 101 course site, right? And so that's why you see Annotation 101 here at the top. And so this is not uh, there's no possibility here of accidentally or even purposefully annotating in public in the wild. Someday we want to enable the ability to move back and forth from private and public environments. But the first thing that we heard from educators about wanting this integrated into the LMS environment is to have a default private experience for the class. And so that's what's enabled now. Um, and you'll see, obviously, that you didn't have to go create a hypothesis account in order to start using this. In fact, uh, a hypothesis account was created for you as soon as you uh, log in and launch um, a reading like this um, and start to annotate on it. Uh, and that is separate from the public account that you may also have uh, to annotate in the wild on the hypothesis site. We also have a dream that someday we can bring those two um, those two experiences together so that one could toggle back and forth between one's private and public sort of annotation modes. Um, but for right now, they're, they're a little bit separate in the sense that the LMS provides that private scaffolded experience and in the wild is, more, is a more public, uh, a public activity. So you can see like Alyssa has made some annotations here and Jennifer Truman, uh, who's a test student and so forth. Um, and one thing that I would ask as we're going through this, um, it's fine to go in and make an annotation that says test, but it's also um, 
even better to make an annotation that actually has some substance to it, right? Um, so that your fellow, uh, your fellow students, if you will, in this course, your fellow instructors and students are not just seeing a bunch of test messages, but are actually seeing uh, something that adds some depth uh, or reaction to uh, the reading itself in the ways that um, Jeremy was talking about in the pedagogy. So as we're just um, kind of guiding around through how this, uh, how this integration works here, you'll notice that this red um, icon here at the upper right uh, lit up at some point. And so um, that means that there are new annotations that have happened um, since I first opened it. And so it doesn't automatically pop those in because sometimes it's kind of, we found that it was kind of disturbing for people to have, you know, when you're in a Google doc and things are just like popping around like crazy and the text is moving, it can actually um, take away from the reading experience. And so we actually make it something that you have to um, consciously do is to bring the new annotations into your view. So every time you see that red icon, that means that there are new annotations to bring in. Um, and so, the act of annotation that's, oh, one other thing that I wanted to just um, guide you to is you'll notice that um, I'm, you know, automatically logged in here um, under the same identity that I have in the Sakai environment, right? And so I didn't have to go make a separate account to do this. It automatically made one for me and logged me in. So the act of making an annotation itself uh, is very straightforward, right? In the sense that you're going to highlight some text and then this little interface will pop up that asks you if you want to make an annotation or make a highlight and Jeremy kind of talked about this a little bit before right an annotation can be a note it could be fully private but it's in going to by default in the context of a course like this is going to be shared with the other people in the private course group um, a highlight is going to be by default something private just for you so if you just want to highlight some text and not add a note to it um, you can you can use that highlight function I'm going to go ahead and click on um, on uh, on annotate here, uh, and of course here in the live uh, in the live demo experience, it didn't actually work as I expected. <laughs> Sorry, now I'm struggling over it. It like made a highlight for me. Uh, Uh oh, <laughs> my live demo has uh, has completely broken down here. I'm going to start over here. Huh? This is uh, this is troubling. Uh, Michael, if you're still here, uh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? That when I go in to make an annotation, it's not uh, it's not taking me to that annotation. Um. Yeah. It's funny because everybody else seems to be having uh, no trouble with it. it. May just be something on my browser side. I here. mean, simple questions. Did you change the order of uh, sorting? So what Michael's referring to is you see this little icon here at the top. Um, that's so that you can change the sort order of the annotations in the sidebar, newest to oldest in location. So I've got it on location. And it seems to be working okay in general. Okay, we've got a lot of annotations going. So I'll, I'll, you guys are obviously already figuring out how to annotate. So I'll, I will stop with my uh, demonstration of how to annotate because you guys have already got that figured out. Um, and uh, definitely uh, raise your hand in the. Um, in the chat if you're seeing the same issue that I am. Uh, I saw that uh, Josh has asked the question, does Hypothesis have a concept of tagging individual to ask for their reactions as Google and others do? Um, so uh, we, there's no sort of like built-in social notification capability yet. It is something that we have on, uh, on the drawing board. If you, um, there is the ability to reply to an annotation that works a little bit differently inside the LMS than it works out in the wild. In the wild, um, you actually get an email um, when somebody replies to one of your annotations, unless you've turned th that notification off. Um, inside the LMS, um, because we're not um, 
we're not uh, kind of capturing the emails to do communication behind the scenes for privacy reasons. Um, we've turned that capability off inside the LMS. But one of the things that I would love to talk about when we get to the discussion sec section is how to um, is how to maybe think about ways in which um, we could use built-in Sakai tools to um, help with the idea of notifications of activity in the annotation layer. Um, so that's something that, that could happen. Uh, I see people are discussing uh, being able to refresh and see uh, new annotations. I have keep hitting that uh, red icon that pops, pops up here um, to bring in more annotations. And so you can see, uh, you can see how many are here. There are 10 now and a page note um, that John added. And you can see uh, one uh, difference just to explain between annotations and page notes is the page notes are annotations just on the document as a whole, as opposed to being anchored specifically in a particular piece of text, like, uh, like these, uh, these individual annotations here that like uh, Adrian and Martin have, have added. Nate. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I tried adding an annotation myself and I realized that because we're viewing this in frame, we have to scroll within the frame, but also scroll within the browser. My new annotation was at the bottom of the browser window, which was beyond frame. So we may just be having a display issue here because of the number of annotations that are contained. Yeah, and maybe that's a good reason to, to always have the document open in a new window. Um, as opposed to having it open inside the frame here. And so one thing I could do, right, is um, go back out to the uh, lessons setup and have it open in a new window. And let's see if that makes a difference. So then you see it would pop open the reading in a completely new browser window, but with the annotation bar enabled. And uh, let's just test if I'm having the same problem here. So I was gonna add something on top of the Emily Dickinson. There we go. Uh, thank you. That was Adam who, uh, who spoke just there, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Thank you, Adam. I thought I recognized your voice and uh, greetings and thanks for coming. Adam was here on Wednesday. I guess I can't spell Emily Dickinson. Uh, and so one thing that's really nice about, um, about the hypothesis interface is that you can add um, links videos, pictures, equations. You can use different character sets. And so I'll uh, this link and this is using a kind of markdown flavor of markdown you can preview it you can add tags oops if you can spell correctly uh, we could also drop in videos directly inside the annotations just by putting in something like a youtube link um, So another thing that you're seeing in this environment that I wanted to bring your attention to is up at the top here, um, I have the kind of gradebook interface. And so for this, um, we've discovered uh, by bringing uh, the LTI tool into, um, into the Tri Sakai site that um, you, you need to turn the gradebook integration on in order for students to have um, the right privileges to annotate. You don't have to grade though. Um, so it's up to you as an instructor if you wanna grade or not. But you'll notice that the grading interface is available here at the top. 
and another thing that it enables you to do is um, move between the students so it's just showing the annotations of each student. So in addition to providing a grading interface, it also provides an easy way to kind of uh, filter the annotation view by student. And so we can see, uh, you know, Lucy, I don't know why we're picking on Lucy today, but uh, maybe because I think of her as an old friend. Um, oh, she has an entire assignment based on this. Do you have a link to that uh, assignment that you could put in there? I'm giving yeah, I'm gonna, you. Yeah, I'll show it at 11. Um, okay. Oh, that is your assignment. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving Lucy a seven on her excellent annotation there. Um, and then we'll see that in the Sakai grade book, I love a live demo. Oh, there we go. Um, Lucy got a seven and I'm not sure, there must be a different grade book item here. Sorry, our, maybe the grade book items got confused a little bit, um, but she got, uh, she got a grade on this new uh, annotation that came in. And this is uh, in the kind of in full disclosure, this is one of the areas that we need to work on because we realize that as you add each reading to the lessons tool, um, it does make a grade book item for it, but it makes that grade book item with the default name of the tool that you're adding to lessons, which is in this case hypothesis. And so I went through and renamed some of the other grade book items that came in here. But um, when it was first added, it just comes through with that default title. And so that's not particularly helpful because you don't want to have just a bunch of grade book items named hypothesis, right? You would want them to be hooked to the actual um, readings themselves. And so that's something that we've identified and we're going to, we're going to figure out a way to address. So one other thing that I wanted to show was just the process of adding a new um, reading to uh, Sakai. Um, and so, uh, and I'm, I appreciate that my colleagues are keeping an eye on the chat there and answering questions as they come up. Uh, so we've got four already added in here, but um, I could add uh, add another um, reading. And so um, because uh, a hypothesis is an external tool, um, I go to the add content menu in lessons and add external tool. And then you can see in this site, hypothesis is the only external tool set up, right? And so I can grab that. And then uh, this might be the place uh, Michael, if you're taking notes, so forth, where <laughs> there might be a moment to intervene in where the uh, grade book item or column was named. Um, so, uh, you know, and you'll see that added a new uh, hypothesis uh, element here to the lessons. Um, and then, I'm sorry, when I open it, I hit the wrong thing, sorry. When I open it, it enables me to pick the text that I wanna use for this reading. And so um, ideally, we'd love to integrate with Sakai Resources. We haven't gotten that far yet, um, but you can do two different things. You can either put in the URL of a public web page um, or a publicly web delivered PDF or you can uh, link to a PDF that you have stored in, in uh, Google Drive. And so in this case, um, I was going to link to uh, an example uh, document that I have open in, where did it go? Here we go. So this is a, it actually happens to be a PDF, um, so I could download it and bring it in as well, but it's a web delivered PDF um, from Educause. And so you see how it, uh, I'm just navigating to it again here. Uh, just trying to get to the root, root version here. And so this is um, a PDF that the Educause website itself delivers. And so I can just grab that URL 
and then going back to Sakai, I can supply it to the lessons tool. And then you can see that that PDF opens in the frame. And then we, as we just discovered, um, another thing that I might want to do is have it open in a new window. And this can give me a chance to, you know, rename the actual item. And so now it's available inside the Sakai environment. And you can see when we open it up with annotation, it's in that private group. So the, there's a couple of kind of UX uh, things to think about in actually adding new material to Sakai, um, but uh, that's how it works. And there uh, would be a grade book item now made for that as well inside the grade book. But again, it, as I mentioned before, it's gonna be called hypothesis and actually it won't, uh, I don't think it'll arrive here in the grade book until we actually enter a grade on it. So I'm going to pause there and take a minute to uh, look at the chat and see what kind of conversation is going on. If anybody wants to um, grab the mic and, and actually speak out, feel free to do that. Uh, Alan was saying, could I show that one more time? You mean, uh, Alan, did you mean the, uh, did you mean show adding a document? Add the new doc. Okay. Yeah, I can show that again. Um, and Wilma has asked the question that I uh, about annotating, uh, being able to print an annotated PDF. Um, and so, uh, I, Michael, would you like to, uh, to answer that question with your voice? Sure. Um, uh, we don't have that. We don't have the ability to, to annotate. Um, uh, I mean, to to print annotated PDF right now. Hypothesis exists kind of like as a like as a transparency on an overhead projector for those of you who are my age or older. Um, and so we, uh, and, and so it's sitting on top of the PDF. The, the annotations are not within the PDF itself. So if you try and print the PDF, from the PDF's point of view, hypothesis isn't there. And hypothesis doesn't have kind of a native printer function yet where you can print the annotations on top of the PDF. We do have an external tool that uh, John Udell, our uh, integration uh, director made, which would allow you with some technical fiddling right now in the LLS app, but it is possible to view and or download any annotations that you made. Um, in the nearer term, we're actually gonna be building tools that'll help you do that within the LMS app itself. Um, those of you who are familiar with the non LMS app and the activity page that's there, we're gonna be building something similar to that within the LMS app. And then that will lead to making it easier to do things like download and print your annotations that you've used in the LMS app. So short answer, no, longer answer, like maybe with a bunch of fiddly bits, which if you want to contact support at hypothesis, which I will put in the chat now, um, I will even spell it correctly. Um, I'm happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one with you and we can walk through um, using that external tool uh, if you like. So just, just let me know. You're welcome. So I noticed that some people were having a, uh a chat about using a content link for an item in resources. And so I was just exploring that. So I uploaded a PDF to, um, to the Sakai resources area here. Um, and I'm just reminding myself, um, oh, I just went past it, didn't I? I'm just reminding myself how to get the URL. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a while since I've been in Sakai. Nate, you're going to have to make it be publicly viewable. Otherwise, Hypothesis is going to ask for a login when it tries to link back to it. And yeah. then just right click and copy the link to it from resources. Okay. And is it remind me where to make it publicly viewable? The checkbox that says this file is publicly viewable right under availability and access. There we go. Sorry, it's saying right in front of me. And then just right click the link. Oops and copy the link address. Right. Okay, so here's a little, since we're having so much fun with our live demo, here is uh, me trying to add a PDF that's in resources. And so Alan, this is me walking through uh, the process of adding a new file again, right in Hypothesis. Um,
I'm going to go ahead and check launch and pop up now. And so what it does is it drops you back into the lessons interface, but with that new tool added, and then you select it again in order to add the actual reading resource. And so in this case, rather than uploading a PDF to Google Drive, I'm going to enter that URL that uh, Adam helped me find from the Sakai resources area. And it looked like it worked. It needs to be renamed. I'm not sure why it's saying that. Huh, I thought I had it open in a new window, but I guess I, I guess I need to fix that. You're seeing me uh, being unfamiliar with Sakai after a few years being away. Huh. It says open in a new page. But choose the radio button, new window. Oh, gotcha. New page. Ah, sorry. Yes. New page is just a new page within lessons. Yeah. Sorry, folks. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So already uh, working with you guys uh, learned a new thing. I, uh, I had thought that it might be possible to um, link to public documents in resources, but I wasn't absolutely sure. So there we tried it out and it worked. But it looks like that option would be great when you're setting it up, right? Because I don't think you had that option with the external tool set up when you were adding it. I might be wrong, but I didn't. Because you check something and you attempted it to be that, but I think it was going to the new page versus opening a new window. Yeah, that, yeah I, when I added the new tool, it, I did check the box for it to open in a, in a new page, but I think that was just a new lessons page still embedded in a frame. It didn't pop it open in a new window. So you're saying when you go in to configure the external tool itself, you have it default to open in a new window? Well, I don't know if that's even possible. I haven't, you know, we disable this feature because we want to curate all external tools. So we don't allow that functionality within lessons within our instance. If you event. set it up at the system level, you have some controls over that. So you can allow people to, to change that setting or make it open in a new window by default. If I may jump in here, uh, sure. Richard from Cape Town. My experience was um, I tried both in two separate lessons. I tried opening in a new window, <clears throat> which launches a, a kind of entire window for the hypothesis um, interface, uh, which was infinitely preferable to launching it in a frame to the Kai window, which takes up a lot of real estate on the page. I'm actually going to cover that in my uh, presentation a little later. Um, the students generally also found it preferable to do the open and new window. Um, so if you have the opportunity, opportunity to enable that, I would recommend it certainly. Yeah, and as Wilma pointed out, that could be, um, that could be set at the system level. Um, Uh, I think I just changed it at the course level too. So we could, we could check that out later. Um, and I'll just say that, um, I believe quite a few of you are instructors in this site. Oops. I went to the wrong window. Uh, but happy to promote anyone else to be an instructor here. Um, I guess I can just toggle everyone except our, uh, you're about to remove everybody. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to remove. Nah. <laughs> I thought there was a way to uh, to toggle people's roles in bulk too. Does changing the name of the item as it appears in gradebook disable the gradebook passback? I would hope not. I would think not either, but we should test that. Or another question I would have is if you fail to rename them, do you end up just having multiple hypothesis entries or does it keep replacing the single one that's there because of the name? 
I actually don't know the answer to that, and we should test that out. Wow, there's. I'm hopping. I'm hopping on right now to try. Okay, great. And yeah. and you did change it site wide. All of those links are now popping up in a new tab. Right. Yeah, and we had set up some of them to do that before. Um, I'm going to leave these to his students. I wasn't um, expecting so many people to be logged in already. This is great. Oh, no, I'll take that back. I don't want to derail the presentation, but I know a lot of people are also working with this in their own systems like myself. Something that I've been puzzling over is how the tool is doing great passback. And then in my external tool configuration, I realized that I did not allow the external tool to return grades, and that may have been my downfall. Um, the documentation and hypothesis that says how to set up the tool in Sakai does not include that checkbox in your documentation. Actually, it does now because yesterday <laughs> <laughs> when we were uh, experimenting with uh, this in this long site site, we discovered that ourselves. And so Michael quickly updated our documentation. So sorry. Oh, about I that. pulled from cash. Curses. <laughs> Curses. But thank you for pointing that out. And this is one of the reasons why I was so happy to be able to have this opportunity to meet with y'all. And I realize this may look like there's a lot of bugs or something, but um, we actually, one of the things that we've struggled with, we're a pretty small organization at Hypothesis. And one of the things that we've struggled with is being able to have um, a really consistent development Sakai environment, which as you all know, it takes, you know, it does take a little bit of care and feeding to get one up and running. And we haven't had the ability to do that for ourselves yet. We're in some talks with some of the community members about how to make that happen. Um, thank you all for that. So at any rate, there is some more work to be done here for sure. Um, and uh, we, uh, we definitely wanna work on it. Um, so uh, sorry that we're encountering some of these things as we move along, but I really appreciate your guys helping us work through it, some of them. And so part of what we wanna do here, and part of the reason why I'm glad Michael is here is, um, to actually capture uh, some of the bumps uh, that we need to we need to address in the system itself. Well, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but it may be the case where if you allow the tool title to be changed, then when adding the external tool to lessons, it doesn't need to be named hypothesis at that point, but you can change it to the target which you want it to be. And then maybe the grade item would be created according to the new name. But that's going to have to potentially be defined there uh, to allow the tool title to be changed because it's defined in the site level. So you're saying uh, allow the tool title? To allow the tool title to be changed, and then you can type in a new name other than hypothesis at the point at which you assign, you create the link from lessons to the external tool. Great. So I, I made that switch. I mean, all of you have the, have the capabilities to have fun in the site, too. And so I see some other people are making some... Um, so feel free to experiment with that. Um, I did want to, I know that a couple of people need to leave uh, in a little bit. And so I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to hear from some, from some other folks too. So we can come back to experimenting uh, with, uh, with the actual site itself in a little bit. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a minute. And oh, uh, no, actually I'm not, I'm gonna go back to our program. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, a couple of people have already stepped up to volunteer to kind of talk about some of their own um, practices with uh, Sakai and collaborative annotation. Um, so Richard and Lucy have already stepped forward, but I wanted to invite anyone else who has um, either uh, an experience already using collaborative annotation, either inside Sakai or not, um, if you want to share, add yourself to the program, or if you have plans to do it and you want us to talk, uh, kind of talk about what you're thinking about um, as a group and sort of discuss it and think about how it could be both enabled technically and pedagogically, then that's also welcome. And so if anybody else would kind of like to join in this community uh, discussion part, um, that would be great. And so Richard, I'm wondering if you are uh, okay to sort of take over uh, now and and talk yeah, to us sure, about sure. your experience. Sure, I can go ahead. Um, there I am. I Yep, there's my video and I will share my screen in a moment. It looks like you're in a really uh, cool lounge space or something. Uh, that's actually my study. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I need to looks do great. some arranging of screens. Uh, 
And so Richard, you're calling in from Cape Town, is that from right? From Cape Town, South Africa, yeah. It's a late afternoon here. And hopefully, right, I should be able to share my screen. That's the one. All right. Um, so I really want to cover some experiences. It wasn't very in-depth. I've used it uh, in two lessons uh, with, my, with my group um, of students, with one particular group of students. Um, to give some background to the context, context it's, uh, it, uh, the course that I used it in is Principles of Digital Curation. It's a master's level course. Uh, we have eight students, a smelly, fairly small student cohort. Um, with the whole COVID-19 restrictions, all the face-to-face -face elements of our blended learning program had to be replaced uh, by completely online. Um, <clears throat> some of the required readings for the course were not available for free online. Um, so students actually needed physical access to the library to access those, those documents uh, or those books, which were on short-term loan. Um, and I had to make a plan to to get those readings to the students. Um, the the elements that I'd chosen for the face-to-face -face teaching in this course were um, were difficult topics. So they were ph philosophically complex topics, uh, and they also dealt with contentious issues like uh, decoloniality, um, feminism, technology, and society. Um, so. I generally prefer to deal with those face-to-face -face with the students, with those topics face-to-face -to -face with the students, because it's, you know, you get a lot more, um, you get a lot more feedback than you do uh, when you're uh, working face-to-face -face than you do in a, an asynchronous or synchronous online environment. Um, we've got a very diverse student cohort, so culturally very diverse, um, very diverse learning background. We join students from all faculties, from the sciences, humanities, law, um, into this program. And also very diverse in terms of tech literacy. So some of them, you know, very tech savvy, very tech aware, um, others very much less so. Uh, the students, uh, since the beginning of the year, had been accustomed to both synchronous and asynchronous online tools. So in Sakai, mainly, um, using a lot of text chats, uh, quite a bit of voice chats, um, and then asynchronous tools like tutorials and quizzes. Um, <clears throat> but they hadn't been exposed to anything like Sakai, like, like Hypothesis. I'd been aware of Hypothesis, but I hadn't, um, I planned to actually only start using it next year after I'd played around with it for a bit. But I was kind of thrown in the deep end in this, in this, with these particular topics. Um, <clears throat> We also have huge diversity in access in South Africa. Some of our students who were, were forced to go back home didn't, uh, to rural areas, didn't have uh, good connectivity. They, um, you know, they're really struggling from an infrastructure point of view. So we really need to, you know, we're, we're really under pressure to deliver to the lowest common denominator um, with data requirements. So. Uh, video lectures, uh, you know, are are not really are not really an option. Are, are not really an option. Video uh, are not really an option. Video conferencing is not a great option. It's not practical um, for our students in the situation that they're in. Um, and not only in South Africa, some of our students in countries like Zimbabwe or Botswana were even an, in even more difficult situation where they didn't even get sponsored uh, sponsored data. Uh, which the South African, some of these South African service providers did, did provide for students. Um, so I used hypothesis um, in lessons um, that were then supported. So I, I released the, the articles that I wanted the students to read on hypothesis um, <clears throat> on a Monday uh, or a Sunday evening. And then I gave them until Friday to do their annotations. And then we had a synchronous text chat after, well, I say one week, um, after five days of exposure to the articles and, uh, and annotation. Um, so the summary of, of my experience, I had some frustrations with copyright and OCR. That's not the fault of hypothesis, but some of the texts that I wanted the students to engage with 
um, I actually needed to sort of try to pirate a bit um, and OCR them to make them to make them editable. Uh, that took up a lot of time, and it wasn't it really wasn't an ideal situation. The OCR capability wasn't great, um, and then my experience loading loading those resources uh, on Google Drive. <clears throat> sort of created an extra step in the process. It would have been much easier if I'd been able to link them directly from the resources tool in Sakai. Um, I had an initial issue with uh, loading the documents um, directly into the hypothesis tool rather than going through the lessons tool. I learned very quickly um, from that mistake, uh, especially as in both lessons, I wanted the students to engage with two different articles, which was not, not possible if you access the tool directly through the hypothesis tool directly through Sakai. You do need to go through the lessons, uh, through the lessons tool. Um, I had a couple of issues and great support from the hypothesis team uh, via email with some of the issues that I had. Um, what I've found with students using quite often using hypothesis to define difficult terms that I would have not have I would not have considered. So, um, where a term came up in an article, where you know I I kind of took it for granted that it, that the students would would know what that term means, um, they would add a definition of the term, which I found. Uh, I found a, a very interesting use of the tools. They weren't only commenting on the content of the articles, they were actually defining terms to each other and finding definitions and comparing definitions. Um, I thought that was, that was quite exciting. Uh, use of tags was a bit erratic in some cases. They were well used in other places, not so much. Um, but uh, definitely, um, I think, um, I would encourage that um, in using hypothesis in future, encouraging students to tag, to use tags. Um, there were some very revealing annotations um, that provided excellent opportunities uh, for further discussion in the, in the synchronous chat at the end of the week. Um, so there were things that I would not necessarily have thought of as topics to discuss in the chats that students raised in their comments uh, through hypothesis um, that also gave um, me a very good sense as a teacher um, exactly where they were and what they found interesting and what they struggled with. Um, that gave me a, a sort of head start with addressing the, the two topics that I, that I was using hypothesis for. Um, so a very useful tool for me as a, as a teacher as well to work out uh, where the students were and what was interesting to them around these topics. Um, there were, there were uneven, uneven levels of engagement, which I expected. Some students really took to it and used it a lot. But in general, um, I asked for feedback on students' experience of using Hypothesis, and they loved it. Uh, universally, uh, they all enjoyed it. They all enjoyed using it. Um, the framed view in Sky is not ideal. I, I did speak about this earlier in a comment I made, um, that it does provide minimum real estate on screen. So uh, get, you know, seeing the whole article or all the, uh, all the comments, uh, all the annotations, all the tags uh, is difficult when you've got this, you know, you're taking up sort of at least 40% of the screen uh, with your, your Sakai frame. Um, so opening in a new window uh, rather than embedding in the Sakai interface does open in a full, a full window. It opens the hypothesis in, interface in a full window. Um, and um, so it, I would say that is a recommended practice. I have a couple of examples that I'll run through very quickly. Um, so here is an example where um, the the article where a student has taken the article, um, taken a term in the article that they didn't understand, and a student actually provided a definition for, for the other students um, uh, of, of the text. So <clears throat> um, um, another example here where um, a student actually provided, you can't see all of it here, but on the right-hand side in the, in the annotation, you can see that the student actually went to a lot of effort 
to provide um, some very good um, and very useful additional content for the students and not just not just something that they provided um, a definition but where they'd uh, kind of gone and dug fairly deep uh, to find external sources that were that were relevant. Moving on to the next one, um, at the top there you can see where the student has um, has highlighted the text where the OCR didn't work all that well. Um, um, and just a you know, an, an example of uh, of um, student engaging at a philosophical level with the content uh, at a, and at a personal level. Um, and in this example, I really wanted to show how uh, students were replying to each other, and then I, as a as a lecturer, could come in, or as a teacher, could come in and provide additional seeds for thought, uh, guiding the discussion towards the objectives that I had for the lesson. Um, and then something interesting that I found um, because of our limitations that we had on data, I had actually truncated the article. Um, and one of the students had actually uh, commented on the fact that that in itself was, uh, was uh, significant. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, that is that is my presentation. I'm not sure if anybody has any any questions for me or any comments. Um, going to stop sharing now. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That was really great. Um, and uh, kudos to you for <laughs> tackling several pesky, difficult issues at the same time. Not only was the material difficult, right, but uh, having to OCR PDFs and um, use technology, unfamiliar technology. So you, you definitely bit off a lot of things all at once there. Thank you for yeah. doing that. <laughs> and also for being willing to present. Did, does anyone want to uh, ask Richard any questions? Did that spark any um, thoughts about uh, how the tool might be used similarly at your at your school? I think it provides some space to try and help students have some guidance, uh, you know, as they go through things. You know, the idea that students went through and were sort of defining terms for one another was great. Um, and even though they may not have necessarily been given very specific directions about what they should do, that they surfaced that was a great thing. And so yeah. in some cases it may be very well, especially when introducing the use of any new tool, um, you know, hypothesis, you know, being one, you know, getting in there and trying to sort of figure out what does it do, how does it work, um, and then getting to the place where it's like, okay, so in this particular case, we're going to use a hypothesis, and I want you to, to look for terms that you're unfamiliar with and attempt to define terms for other people in the course or, or something yeah. of the sort. Yeah, um, that, that was one of the, not only was I thrown in the deep end, I threw my students in the deep end as well. I would have ideally have had more time to prepare them for using a hypothesis. I mean, I had, I do at the beginning of the academic year, introduce them to all the other tools that they'll be using. I give them a kind of a demo of the tools that, that they'll be using throughout the course. And I hadn't had the chance to do that with hypothesis because it was kind of an emergency, you know, throw in the deep end thing. Um, and they, they took it very well, but uh, yes, in an ideal situation, I would introduce them to, the tools um, up front and how they would how they could use them, but it was also nice to see how the behavior emerged in that situation where they didn 't have that pre patterning around how they should or ought to use the tool, and they came up with things that i hadn 't expected yeah that 's really great, uh, Richard, because I think you hit on a couple of things that jeremy was was gesturing toward too, and that 's that um, you know, if we meet on the book, as in the words that he was using, um, like all sorts of interesting things can happen that we might not have expected, right? And as we read together, we also end up um, kind of inventing new ways of, of reading um, 
by doing it collaboratively and together. And so it seems like your students really experience that. You know, Jeremy also mentioned the idea of um, having annotation on your syllabus be one of the first things that you might do in a course. And that's a great way to introduce students just to the act of annotation itself, in addition to getting them to focus on your syllabus. Um, so a yeah. lot of instructors have used that as the sort of introduction to annotation in their course. Really great stuff. I uh, wish I had been in that class, actually. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I may I may need to uh, I may need to enroll in uh, University of Cape Town coming up. I I do need to finish my doctorate. So, ah, no problem. You'd be most welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll talk about some online online work later. So I know we have. Um, I don't want to cut short the discussion around Richard's stuff, but uh, I know Lucy was going to go next and share some things from NYU experience, and she also has to leave soon. So I wanted to open things up to her to talk to us for a little while. Lucy, do you want to go? Sure. Let me um, let me share my screen. I think it's presentable. Um, so I'm not as organized as Richard was. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'll just give you, we have a couple of use cases that we're using hypothesis for this summer. Our main issue is very close to what Richard talked about, which is that we are gearing up for um, a fall semester that's going to involve more remote teaching for faculty and student population that are largely used to face-to-face -to -face classes. So um, we also have a very strong global distribution of students and um, with travel restrictions, not all of those students are going to be able to make it back to New York City this fall. So one of the things we're encouraging faculty to do is to um, increase, is to um, start a fairly significant um, async, plan for a fairly significant asynchronous piece of their um, of their course. And that can be very challenging for people who are used to um, judging student engagement by how much they talk in class and what they do in class. Um, but we also think that this is an opportunity for faculty to um, really drill down on teaching skills that kind of get glossed over. So for example, when I'm teaching a novel, nor, um, I teach close reading by usually dividing the class up and we have about four questions that we work on in small groups together. Um, and we go and, you know, kind of, I, I float around the room and um, they identify passages and then we work through those passages and come back together. So um, I think, you know, what, what Jeremy was saying about making reading visible is one of the advantages we have in using an asynchronous tool like this to ground our discussions actually in the text. So one of the things that we're doing this summer is we are, first of all, giving faculty the opportunity to be students in an online course, which, um, which is something that's very new for most of them, and the opportunity to engage with each other um, using these methods and to kind of think about how they would use them. So that's the first use that we have for Hypothesis this summer. Um, you can see how we embed it. We do not have the Sakai integration at NYU. So we are, um, we will embed the, um, we embed the link to our group. I create a new link, a new group every week. And then um, our faculty members head over and they discuss these articles together. This is another educational, this is a web page. So the other thing that we try to do is we try to show them a variety of uses for it. So um, that, I'm oh, sorry, this is not, this is a, so this is a scanned OCR text. Um, but we also show them um, web pages um, uh, we, and we give them a sense. So I think this one, um, let's see, here we go. Yep. So this is, uh, this is a web page. So uh, I think someone else mentioned multimedia. Um, we, we try to give them the sense of um, providing a lot of different types of materials in their class, um, getting out of just like having students uh, not read a textbook and then um, and the faculty repeating lectures. So that's the first use that we're using this summer. We're trying to get them used to this idea of um, a lot of different ways to use asynchronous content. And then um, we have some suggestions for them for how they can think about building the, these assignments over the whole semester. Um, so here is um, an assignment um, that we have come up with an example assignment called marginalia um, and we created this assignment you guys can take a look at that I'm going to show you what it looks like that's kind of just the um, 
open page in uh, a Google Doc. So um, we've, you know, one of the things that faculty also tell us about students in online discussion forums is that they can feel very stilted or forced. So we've tried to give them a sense of how they can build a sign, use something like um, text annotation as the first, as the foundational step um, in building larger assignments. So um, in many Dine Ed courses um, in the humanities, one of the goals is to get students to learn how to do close reading and then to use the text to make arguments. So, um, we kind of walk them through how you build this in for the semester. So um, and the one that I shared in the margin, in the kind of over overarching piece that I shared with you, um, this is a, a larger assignment for a philosophy, history, and religion kind of combination gen ed course. And um, the conceit that we gave the faculty members over the course of the semester is the idea of marginalia because often so one of the goals of this class one of the learning goals of the class is to have students um, begin to ask questions about philosophy and these different um, approaches to um, thinking about life's big questions and try to internalize those questions um, 18 to 22 year olds, which is our, our learner population, um, sometimes some of them are really excited about that and some of them don't engage with it. So we gave them an example of a marginalia assignment that would give the students personas to try on over the course of the semester in order to make this seem less artificial. One of the general things that we've talked to faculty about, about moving their work to an asynchronous format is getting students to have a stake in asynchronous discussions. Um, and you want that always. I actually think that this move to online courses is gonna improve our face-to-face -face courses, um, but uh, because we're slowing things down and going deeper, but definitely you need it for online. So um, we have the marginalia assignment. We give examples of Joshua Reynolds and, uh, and Blake. Um, there's a great exhibit of, uh, a Blake, great Blake exhibit at the Met Museum, which is just on the block from my house. And um, it, had, it had pages of Joshua Reynolds aesthetic treatises and Blake had just scribbled all over it, like all of his ideas, put his name above it. So we have photos of, uh, of some of the, the examples um, that are embedded in the assignment for students to see kind of what this looks like in the print context, because we're not taking for granted that they've all seen this kind of thing. Um, they're not all ancient like I am. Um, and we have we give them an example of philosophy in the margins about how people work out. They used to sell books with large margins for people to work this out. And then we give an example of how you might set this up every week. So the one I'm just going to show you guys is um, one week of this would be um, they're going to use um, chapter 24 of Machiavelli um, and the student's job in in reading Machiavelli is to imagine how they would use this material to advise a candidate who was running for re-election. And then we actually have an example of um, a candidate, uh, someone who did this with um, Tony Blair. And, um, and so we also have another tool, which is um, a Noto, which is a video annotation tool. So um, the students use that as well to have discussions. Um, so they watch a video and then they, um, and then they have the assignment to, uh, to go and to take on the persona of, of this uh, campaign advisor and to read the Machiavelli and kind of use the annotation for, harvest, for harvesting um, materials that you would use. Um, the thing that I'll say about this, the other operational thing I'll say about this is that for both video and um, text annotation, we also have found that um, small groups are better. So um, we advise them to have permanent small group cohorts that stretch through the semester. And that can, um, that can help also visibility of students. So one of the things you'll see, I mean, I think you saw it in our 
working together on that text um, and today is that um, the more people you have, the crazier the um, the crazier the markup gets. And I don't know if you've ever like had a Kindle book where every single thing has been marked up by every other person who's read it. It's kind of useless. So, um, in having students be in groups of of three to seven, depending on the size of the class, um, you can really keep an eye on um, who's who's responding. There's a you know most of the great great texts that we use. There are just a bunch of key areas and you know once one student tags that in a large class nobody else can tag it so you have the opportunity for um more students to get the up to get the chance to do that kind of discovery in the small groups um and then the other thing as i mentioned before is that um we found that this is a really great activity um, often students need learning to learn or metacognitive materials so we find that annotation is a great learning to learn material on how you approach writing a paper, right? So, um, you know, students will have a paper and it's due and like they don't even know where to start, right? So in doing assignments like the marginalia assignment, you give students a kind of structure of moving toward that larger assignment that may be um, what we're working with faculty who may be teaching all asynchronous classes or classes that only have a check-in once every two weeks. So they have a really firm, um, assignment structure that starts with an annotation assignment and then the materials from that discussion are used in like a one to two page response paper and then that's further refined into like a four page paper. It also stops one of the issues that we see we have seen in the move to emergency remote teaching which is a massive increase in plagiarism and cheating because students get overwhelmed they get off track and so if you're a faculty member and you are moving through these small groups in annotation, which is exactly what I would be doing in a live classroom, uh, moving among the groups working on these particular questions, um, you can see um, who's, found, who's found good passages in the text. You can highlight things, you can bring them out for the larger groups to talk about. So you kind of keep your finger on the pulse from the beginning. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm not sure if it was that was helpful sharing at all. I'm not sure if there are any questions that people want to um, pipe up with um, or any other I ideas. Um, I see Franny's question about student cohorts. Yeah, so um, small group cohorts are kind of like this multi multi purpose cleaner, right? You have, um, because, uh, you know, some of our, just like in knowing what the hygiene situation is going to be in New York, we're probably not going to be able to have like full classes. We have, a, our classrooms are a vertical stack, right? So we're, so 50% um, capacity for buildings. We're imagining even a class of 25 might have to meet in two groups. Um, I mentioned our geographic dispersal to people. So, you know, one of the things that we're trying to think about is how do we give a meaningful face to face experience to students um, that also builds community over the semester. And, um, and so we find these um, permanent cohorts can be a way of doing that. Uh, we will have a significant chunk of our students who will be um, remaining in China until travel restrictions lift. And so we want to have location aware. Um, yeah, yeah, um, the cohort model does require teacher resources, but um, it actually is easier, I think, than dealing with 30 different, um, if you have kind of five, five groups of six, it can be, there can be efficiencies at scale, but Richard, you're absolutely right, you have to be organized. So I have just been working today, we have a document that kind of says, here are the things that you want to do, and that's also why you want to do it at the beginning of the semester. Um, I think it does. And so, and it, I think, you know, building those small groups um, can be hard. Um, we were like, okay, everybody have a freshman year experience. And so giving them tasks to do together, like annotation, um, can create a me kind of more meaning to that. Um, so yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if anybody else has questions, but um, there we I go. I was really interested to hear, Lucy, that, I mean, this seems to have been folded so much into your thinking uh, at NYU around kind of pandemic planning, if you will. And so I'm, I'm really interested in exploring this idea of, um, you know, how, uh, how bringing students and faculty together in this time um, is difficult and then maybe you know, made different by uh, this possibility of reading together in this way. Uh, have you found um, that the this idea is resonating 
like across NYU, um, or is it is it more localized? Um, well, you know, so arts and science is the biggest group at NYU, so we're kind of like a little NYU. We have all the problems, all the weirdnesses, all the amazing things too. So it definitely has um, resonated across across our group. But um, actually, we have. Um, significant groups of people using it in the silver school of social work um in um they use it a lot for uh, working on they have a case study model for their graduate program and so it's really helpful in scaffolding the case method um and in an asynchronous environment our gallatin school of, of individualized study uses it as well um, it's, it can be very helpful to, for teaching disciplinary reading conventions. Um, so we see that we see that a lot as well in Gallatin. You may have students who come from a bunch of different backgrounds into like an economics class or whatever. So it can be very helpful to kind of model this is how you read like whatever. In terms of bringing people together, I have found um, in our online course, and I saw that someone maybe Dave is also trying to do this. I have found faculty love the communal reading experience. Um, they love, the, um, I have chosen popular texts by which I mean like, you know, the latest hot take on like, we should do it this way, we should do it that way. And they feel overwhelmed by people th throwing these texts at them, throwing these links at them. Um, and so I think it's also been kind of a stress reduction to be able to kind of like say like, you know, you don't have to follow this. Here's somebody's ideas. Let's take this apart and does this apply to you or not? Here's the, here's the hot take from the Chronicle this week. Do we really need to do high touch, whatever? And so I think it's been, so I think it's been helpful in that way, um, which may not be the way you're thinking. But just in terms of, as I said, I am very hopeful that this time that we're in is going to make for better face-to-face -face classes. And I think that most of our face-to-face -face classes are black boxes. The textbook is a black box. The lecture is a black box. Um, we do not give students an apparatus for the kinds of learning we want them to do. And so I think um, having tool annotation tools are vital. And, and I love our Anoto. Uh, we have also a set of assignments called Talking Back to Lecture, um, where students are invited to stop and pose questions to lectures and identify items in, in a video. I think this is really important to slow things down, assign less reading, have students go deep into that if you assign two chapters nobody ever reads it assign 10 pages and work that sucker up make sure they know what they're supposed to do um and I, so i think we're going to get to better teaching that's probably not what you asked but i i love this idea of um getting to uh having the face-to-face -face classes actually benefit from the moves online uh in in return and uh what you're saying about that, that apparatus and the idea of slowing reading down you may remember back in Jeremy's part of the uh, part of the show here, he mentioned how we talk about annotation making reading uh, visible, active, and social. And I think a lot of it does have to do with slowing things down so that people are, instead of just reading, and I do this too, where you just sort of absorb uh, the text and you don't even really engage with it mentally, to just stop and just by pausing and um, asking yourself to add a note um, just changes the reading process on a fundamental level by slowing it down. Yeah, and I would say to that that, um, as I mentioned, like with Gallatin and in many of our Gen Ed courses, most of our students don't know how to read these texts. So I can actually, and I did in my undergraduate career, read chapters of economics. I can physically read those things and I got nothing when I'm done with that, right? I don't have a reason for reading it. I don't have a process, way to process. So I think especially if, so the worst way to use an annotation tool is to just say, go forth and annotate, right? The best way is to, in the beginning, heavily model, right? To say like, this is really important in here. This is what we're looking for. This is how to read this text. These are good examples. And it looks different. Close reading skills look different for um, case method in social work than they do for, you know, going going deep in Dante, you know. So yeah, I to I totally agree. Go going to the ninth circle in Dante, right? Yeah, uh, we're living in that now, so we're. Oh, good. are uh, we already in the ninth yeah, circle? That, yeah, that, that means there's no more circles to come, right? <laughs> murder hornets. Once murder hornets came out, it was like, yeah, we're there. We're definitely there. 
I do um, have to, I do have to peel off. I'm sorry. That's um, okay. It's so, so great of you to come. Yeah. So good to see y'all, but um, cause I have to go do actually a faculty workshop at noon. So imagine that. So, but I'm happy for people to chat um, at my NYU address. And I think people know, know how to get me in the Sakai community. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. Um, Bye. Well, very well done. Thanks to both Richard and Lucy for sharing. Um, as she signs off, I actually wanted to um, uh, touch on a couple of things that Lucy brought up. Um, and one is this idea of, um, you know, she just actually mentioned it again, this idea that, you know, not every student or every teacher or every person really comes to text um, like fully equipped necessarily to do reading in that disciplinary mode that they're in. And I think Richard explored this as well. Um, I wanted to share another example here and I'm going to um, bring up my screen again um, from the STEM world because I think uh, a lot uh, a lot of um, I'm going to put the link in here too. A lot of, uh, you know, the early annotation um, sort of adoption has happened in the humanities, which makes sense because you can, you know, folks like, like uh, Jeremy as an English teacher, you know, annotation, as he mentioned, is already part of his, his apparatus and, you know, what he did with, with pedagogy. And so it was an easy jump to make it digital and make it collaborative and so forth. In the sciences, it's a little bit different, and but yet the um, the kind of literacies that are needed to engage with scientific texts can be very intense, right? So I wanted to draw your attention to this program from uh, it's actually a, a AAAS project, Science in the Classroom, and the the purpose of Science in the Classroom is to provide an environment where beginning STEM students can actually learn how to read and engage with actual scientific texts. So not textbooks, right, where things have been distilled and massaged for their easy consumption, but actual um, scholarly work um, in the field. And they use annotation to do that. And so I'm just navigating into one of the articles here at random, um, because I, I don't know anything about <laughs> any of these topics, being a humanities person myself. And you'll see that this is a, um, an article um, by Adam Thomas. Oh, I'm sorry, annotated by Adam Thomas. Um, but it is a uh, original paper by Fred Buns et al. that was published um, you know, in, a, in a journal. And you can see um, that uh, on the side here, they have this learning lens. And so what they've done is um, they've used annotation as a tool to walk through this challenging text and provide sort of scaffolding for different kinds of literacies with reading it. And so what Science in the Classroom has done is they actually use hypothesis behind the scenes and they have advanced uh, science students do the annotations themselves and build the annotations, but then they present them in a modified interface here, which is this learning lens environment. And so I, you can see I flipped on the glossary view of it here. And so what that means now is that the, um, the words that they've defined uh, in this, in this uh, text that people may not be familiar with have been defined through annotations. And so I can toggle that on and off. And then you can also see there are other uh, learning lens toggles here, like um, links to uh, sort of more detail about the author's experiments. Um, you know, and so you can see that there's all sorts of different ways here that the annotations are used to kind of provide a scaffolding around how to engage with a text that's this complex and challenging. Um, so annotation is kind of working on two levels here. Advanced students are using annotation as a way to kind of improve their own practice of reading and then expose that out so that um, beginning students uh, and readers might have the benefit of that that annotation on top of the text itself so that they can they can sort of like build up their skills in reading a disciplinary text like this. Uh, so I thought of that um, example just when um, Lucy was bringing up this idea of kind of deep disciplinary reading or also when, when Richard was talking about his experience. So uh, I, I know we've been talking at you for a little while now and we actually just skipped right over having uh, that early break. So sorry about that. Um, but uh, I thought I'd make sure to see uh, if anyone else in the assembled community here wanted to uh, step up and talk about um, any 
experiences they've had or plans that they're making or ideas that they have about using annotation in, at their school? Anyone else want to uh, step in front of the crowd? You, oh, Adam, go ahead. I don't have much substantive to say, but I just know that we've had a couple of instructors who have been interested in evaluating hypothesis and um, kudos to hypothesis for waiving fees through the end of 2020 in order to allow us to uh, kick the tires during COVID-19. That's greatly appreciated. So uh, I've actually been setting up the LTI tool in my instance and working with it. And it, it seems very straightforward. Thanks for mentioning that, Adam. Yeah, we, I mean, as an organization, when the pandemic hit at first, like everybody, I think we were just a little, you know, like taken aback, like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Um, and then we kind of just stopped and asked ourselves, um, what can we do? And, you know, we're a little bit different than some of the other technology providers out there, which would be, of course, very familiar to the Sky community and the Imperio community, which is a different kind of community. And you have, you know, actors like Longsight among you who act in really ethical, good ways, right? Um, and so, we're a nonprofit organization and we stopped and asked ourselves like to be aligned with our mission and try to support folks during the pandemic. What, what is it that we can do? And we took a hard look at things. Um, and even though we, we use uh, scaled use with LMS integration as, uh, as a way to uh, sustain ourselves. And so we ask institutions that are, that are using hypothesis in this way to contribute to our sustainability. We uh, figured out a way to make it possible to, to waive all that for, for at least the year of 2020 um, as the pandemic uh, sort of got underway because we knew that so many people were going to maybe want to have this opportunity like you're, just, you're suggesting, Adam, to kick the tires or maybe even start going more full bore with, with uh, hypothesis. And Jeremy's team has been incredibly busy um, helping support to make that happen. So I'm glad that people are having good support experiences like Richard mentioned, because we have been inundated. Uh, and so we have been uh, working really hard to keep up. Um, and so we appreciate your, uh, your patience. Um, is there anybody else who had anything they wanted to add in? If not, I'm gonna suggest that we take a, a quick break and then come back um, if you're still interested in, in doing more annotation. Um, and I have a, a kind of group annotation activity that I wanna ask us to do together. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, take a break until, uh, so it's nine o'clock, almost nine o'clock Pacific time. Um, so that would be uh, right almost noon Eastern. And I guess some of you are in other time zones. Let's come back at 10 after the hour, um, wherever, wherever your hour happens to land um, and use this as a chance to like stretch ah, and hydrate, maybe get a snack, something like that. Um, and so I am gonna do that myself and I will come back here uh, at 10 after and um, start to talk with you about um, doing a little bit of group collaboration amongst ourselves that uh, will give us an experience about how this can happen for a group of professionals like we have gathered here today. So see you in a few minutes, folks. here. Um, it seems a little different in the LMS environment because we were like uploading resources to Sakai or putting resources inside, uh, you know, it could be Google Docs or, um, or <clears throat> whatever. And, uh, but because hypothesis in general comes to the text wherever the text lives, your ability to actually reach the underlying text is also at issue, right? And so there's two things always in operation there um, uh, that could give trouble in countries where access is more uh, controlled, like in China, um, so that the underlying text needs to be available and hypothesis needs to be available to sit on top of it. So um, finally, uh, thanks for, uh, uh, being able to figure it out and I'm glad you were able to, but um, there, is, there is a little bit of trickiness in that environment. Um, 
another thing that is also possible um, that we didn't even discuss here is the ability to actually annotate PDFs locally on your own computer, but in such a way that people who have the same PDF on their computers can also see the annotations. Seems a little bit like black magic, but if you're using Hypothesis in the wild, you can actually uh, open a PDF like in the Chrome browser on your desktop and annotate it there. Of course, you would need internet connection to Hypothesis for this environment because the annotations need to go be stored on the Hypothesis server. Um, and then if so, another user opens that exact same PDF on a different computer, um, you didn't have to send it to, you didn't have to send them your annotations, but they do need to be working from the same um, document, like maybe they got it from the Sakai Resources area. Um, they will, and they log in, they will be able to see any annotations on that document that are either public or part of a private group that they're a member of as well. And so there, there's actually ways to use it. Um, I won't call it fully offline because hypothesis needs to be online, but the PDF document itself doesn't need to be distributed on the web. So that's another, another mode for working that may work in areas where uh, content is being blocked. Uh, and it all has to do with the PDFs having shared met metadata that Hypothesis can tie the annotations to, and there's um, some deep, deeper technical uh, information about that on the, uh, on the Hypothesis website if you're really interested. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is, in, is anyone here in the crowd, um, I know we've lost a few people, um, maybe they're still going to come back, but um, is anybody in the crowd uh, calling in from Australia today? I wanted to um, talk a little bit about Australia, and I was hoping that maybe there would be somebody with, <laughs> from Australia who would be able to speak about it with more intelligently than I could. Any any Aussies or people currently living in Australia? I know we have some South Africans. Yeah, you're right, Richard. It would be quite late. <laughs> I, hadn't, uh, I hadn't thought about the time zone difference. Yeah, uh, it's actually, it's actually probably uh, yeah, it's tomorrow already. Good, very good point. You can yeah, see that. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would say I had some I had some clarifications on the China issue. I, I was listening, but I, if I repeat something you said, I apologize. But um, we we uh, the proxy server that's driving the LMS app is different from our other proxy server. And I think Nate says, but our our like web app proxy server does seem to have been uh, uh, banned, probably based on non-compliant usage of it. Um, uh, but so far, we do have LMS users in China, and so far, they haven't reported any difficulties. So my guess is that the more restricted use case of that proxy server isn't going to get us in trouble. Of course, who knows? Like what'll happen? Like things may, you know, we we can't control if that happens to us. But if you're using the LMS app, you should be able to use it straight up without needing a VPN is my understanding. Oh, that's great detail, Michael. Thank you. I didn't know that. I know you've been looking into it more lately. Um, so uh, Fun Lee, that, may, that actually may make a difference then. If you're using Hypothesis in the wild, then um, that the proxy server for Hypothesis may be blocked unless you're using a VPN like you are, um, but perhaps not in the LMS integration environment. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, I guess that um, because I am uh, properly caffeinated, I neglected to understand how time passes. I get really confused with the international dateline and everything. So of course, there's nobody from Australia here because it is two in the morning there. <laughs> um, yeah, I have uh, I have spent some interesting times with folks uh, uh, when you have one of those calls where it's Australia, Europe, and the United States all trying to talk to each other at the same time. Usually somebody's either not awake or drunk, uh, which can make for some interesting conversations. Uh, I know the Sakai community being very global uh, runs into this issue a lot. The reason that I'm bringing up Australia though is, I don't know if um, you all heard uh, this very recent news, but as you know, each country is sort of dealing with, um, dealing with the pandemic and the, uh, the aftermath of the economic side of what happens with the pandemic. I don't even know if aftermath is the right word. Um, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to something that um, Kate Bowles, I don't know if you're familiar with Kate Bowles, who's an Australian educator, brought to my attention. Um, and I'll put this, uh, 
this link here in the chat as well. Um, and I want to use this as a way to introduce um, kind of our next activity. Um, but uh, as, and part of the struggle around funding for higher education that we're, we probably all experience, but I guess Australia has been having a really tough time with, um, they decided to make this move where it's actually going to be more expensive to get a uh, an humanities oriented education in Australia than, than a STEM oriented education. And I can understand that if there's a supply and demand issue and there aren't enough STEM folks and maybe this is a market intervention to try to make that happen. But um, a lot of people that I know are um, concerned about this idea of pricing different kinds of um, disciplines, education in different disciplines differently, um, especially uh, if you fold into it the idea of having uh, a well a well-rounded education and, and what that can bring to you. Um, so I know there's a lot of um, uh, kind of uh, concern about this in the Australian context right now. And the reason that I bring it up here is um, I was really happy to um, be able to watch the keynote from Kathleen Fitzgerald that you all um, probably experienced as well, or if not, the recording is already up on the Aperio YouTube channel. And as because Kathleen touched on so many uh, kind of questions about um, what institutions of higher education are going to be like <laughs> in the coming years as, the, as they start to evolve, and we're kind of um, we're uh, kind of going through multiple crises altogether. Right? There's there's crises in the legitimacy of intellectual pursuits in general. There's crises in the funding of higher education institutions. There's political crises. There's social justice and equity crises. There's a global pandemic. And then sitting behind that, of course, is the um, global climate change crisis, which we have maybe uh, slipped a little bit from view with the pandemic uh, you know, on us right now. but. Um, to me, that's a, a huge concerning crisis that we haven't even really fully dealt with yet. And so as we start to navigate through all these um, situations, as people who are, think that education is a good way to equip humans to deal with different kinds of situations, um, I, I felt like Kathleen, uh, Kathleen's work is particularly kind of interesting um, and, and touches on um, ways of thinking about that, that that we might all benefit from. So I th was thinking that um, as a kind of collaborative annotation exercise for ourselves, that we might uh, spend a little bit of time diving into a text of Kathleen's um, that um, she definitely talked about in her keynote as well. So the ideas won't be unfamiliar to you. Um, and I've uh, there's a couple different ways that we can do this. She actually has um, uh, a complete uh, book version of her, um, sorry, I keep counting to the wrong window, of her entire work, Generous Thinking, online at, at generousthinkinghcommons.org. Um, and this, um, oh, sorry, Charles. Yes, we have restarted. <laughs> but you haven't really missed anything because I'm, um, I'm just sort of bringing up uh, the next sort of activity right now. So um, Generous Thinking is the book that Kathleen Fitzgerald um, published a while back that kind of gets at some of these ideas. Um, and the entire book is online and it's actually put into a environment that enables paragraph level annotation, which is okay. Um, and, and that's certainly something, uh, there's a lot of annotations on, on the work in this form. Um, like you can see, uh, this is the introduction and uh, there's two like page notes here. <laughs> uh, and there are comments on particular paragraphs. And so this uses a different system, not hypothesis to enable kind of annotation at the paragraph level. Um, but what I thought might be uh, a better exercise for us is um, Kathleen also published the introduction to her um, to her work, Generous Thinking, on her blog. So it's available as a public web page there. And it's actually already received quite a few annotations. And so I thought this might be an interesting way for us 
uh, to explore doing some annotation ourselves. And I wanted, I could, we could obviously bring this into the Tri Sky site and, and annotate it there. But in that context, all our annotations would be private to the group in Tri Sakai. And since it's just a demo site and stuff, it might go away. I thought it might be better if we actually do this work out on the open web. You're not required to annotate if you don't want, but I, I want to invite you to. Um, and so uh, the way to um, make sure that you're equipped to uh, participate in this is actually pretty easy because um, one of the things that I didn't uh, show you all before was when you're annotating out on the, on the web um, and you, uh, I'm in the Chrome browser as you can see and I've navigated to this web page on, um, on Kathleen's site um, and then I flipped on the hypothesis Chrome extension, right? So that I have the tool available and I'm looking at the public group here and I can see uh, all the annotations on it. And if I scroll down, you know, here they are. Um, but you can easily share uh, an annotation enabled version of this page that doesn't require anyone to go get a uh, browser plugin um, by using this handy little tool that's in the Hypothesis sidebar. So if you yourself have a uh, Hypothesis open on a public web page like this, you can click the share icon and that brings up a special link that you can copy, and I will put it into the chat now, and share with folks. And this actually brings Hypothesis on top of whatever the page is, in this case, Kathleen's blog page, um, together, uh, even for people who haven't already equipped their browsers with the um, Hypothesis tool. So this is actually kind of handy in a couple different ways because not only can you share out a link like this in email or tweets or, um, you know, uh, you could put it in uh, a Sakai resource. You can make it a link in Sakai resources, right? Um, so it, it kind of helps with enabling people to annotate without putting them through the process of getting the tool themselves. But it also then makes it available in mobile devices. Um, mobile devices are a little tricky because there's not a whole lot of screen real estate on mobile devices. Um, yeah, you can, uh, Sungyun, you can use the Chrome extension if you want, or you can follow that link and annotation will be enabled, uh, enabled on top of it already. Uh, but uh, tablets, for instance, which have a little bit more screen real estate, um, are really great reading environments for some people and it's very useful to annotate in those contexts as well. And so by uh, sharing uh, an annotation enabled link like this, you can then start to annotate in a tablet or mobile device. Um, it's still, the experience is still a little tricky on a very small screen, um, but, it, but it, it definitely is possible. And so until we get to the point where, uh, until we get to the point where you have something more like a dedicated hypothesis mobile app, um, this, is, this is the best way to enable mobile experiences to get that in the wild is to get that special link uh, from the sharing icon and uh, share it out. And so I've, I put it there in the chat. And what I'm thinking that we might do is I'm gonna shut up uh, after I give you guys a chance to ask any questions. And I'm gonna suggest that we spend some time reading and exploring this uh, introduction to Kathleen's work. Um, we can look at the annotations that are already there. There are pretty extensive conversation going on. Um, and then maybe start to add some of our own. And I'm gonna do that alongside with you. Um, so before I uh, be totally quiet and give us a chance to read, um, are there any kind of questions or observations or thoughts about uh, what, we're, what we're gonna set off to do here? Otherwise, I invite you to get started. And if you don't already have a, an individual hypothesis account, um, there should be a link in the upper right hand corner of the sidebar itself to sign up and get an account. Um, and so you can, you can do that right from the sidebar if you follow that link that I shared up above here in the chat. So feel free to keep using the chat. Um, and I'll keep an eye on it in case uh, any questions or observations come up. I'm gonna now uh, be quiet and start to do some reading myself. I will point out that if you want a completely clean reading environment, you can also toggle off the highlights. And so there's this button on the right-hand side that toggles the highlights on and off. 
And so if you would prefer to kind of read without sort of encountering all the annotations as you go along, you can also do that.
Sun Yun, uh, you asked if it's uh, possible to sort the posted annotations by date. And so there, if you look at my screen again, there's a little tool in the upper right corner of the hypothesis sidebar with the two arrows pointing up and down. And that enables you to sort the annotations on the page um, in a couple of different ways. So here's with the oldest at the top, the newest at the top, and then by document location. One thing you might make sure is that you uh, actually click on the word annotations to make sure that all annotations are being shown. Seems to be working okay for me. Might try refreshing your page, uh, Sung Yun, if that doesn't work. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. I guess I can just do it here. Richard, I've activated your account. Great, thanks for doing that, Michael. Michael, do you see the conversation with Song Yin about the ordering of annotations, the sorting? Sorry, answering something else, then I'll. Uh, okay, yeah, just a second. So I'm calling on Michael because he's uh, has even deeper knowledge than me. I think part of the issue for me is that I'm in the middle of um, actually writing an annotation. So I want to finish that too before I uh, play around too much. Just give me a second here. Sorry, what, what was the question so I can help answer it? Uh, Sung Yun is just trying to explore the sorting by date functionality and doesn't seem to be, thinks it may not be working correctly on this page. Uh, Fondly, thanks for that, uh, that note. Yeah, I mean, social learning in general, right? Not just not just annotation, but um, you know, Lucy was talking about annotation on top of video too. There's all forms of different kinds of annotation, um, but there's other kinds of social learning too, right? Learning together as humans. Um, there's a lot of work out there that demonstrates that um, or suggests that socially oriented learning processes are, are the ones that are actually most successful. Um, one other thing that I wanted to make sure to bring to everybody's attention too is a book by um, Remy Collier, who Jeremy mentioned. And, um, and his colleague, Antero Garcia, um, which is a, a book about annotation in general. And one of the great, um, one of the great uh, sort of things that um, they bring up in this work is how many things that happen in the world can be viewed as annotations, all the way from graffiti to um, uh, all sorts of different kinds of examples just drawn from the, the real world uh, and sort of thinking about what it is to kind of make a note on the world, um, whether it's in a book or in some other format. Um, it's a really interesting read and also um, is published on the PubPub platform, which has yet another uh, 
kind of annotation capability set built into it. Uh, so if you want to try out yet another way to annotate things, um, PubPub provides uh, that too. I put a link to it in the chat. So just to jump in really quick, I can't replicate the sorting function not working. Nate, is it not working for you too? You're, you're muted. I thought it was working for me too, uh, but yeah. I'm in the middle of crafting an annotation right now. Right, and I would I don't want to disrupt perfection, so don't worry about it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. No, unfortunately, I just can't replicate it. So, um, yeah, if you if you go to the sort menu and choose newest, you should be able to see things. I mean, mine starts with like ten minutes ago, and then uh, twelve minutes ago, and then back to May nineteenth, twenty nineteen. So um, everything seems to be in order there. In terms of the other one. Um, to only to see only unread posts. I don't know. Hypothesis doesn't know whether or not you've read them. I guess maybe what you're saying is like on a refresh of a page, can you only show me annotations that weren't on the page the last time that I looked and don't show me annotations that were on the page. And I don't think we know like when you like last looked at the page, like we don't store that data. So we're not going to know what annotations you did or didn't see. So we're always going to serve up all the ones that are available now and then show, I saw you guys discussing earlier, the like new slash updated annotation icon, which is the red little down arrow. And then if, and then, uh, and, um, and so like that, that's always going to update the sidebar. But other than that, I don't, we don't have a way of knowing what you have or haven't read. And yeah, I mean, so what's your, what's your reporting, what's, what's, what's been reported here in the most recent comment in, Zoom, uh, I think is accurate. If you're sort, if you're sorting from newest to oldest, then it should go ten minutes, twelve minutes, and then back to into May and, and earlier. So that that looks correct to me. So Yun, if you wanted to share your screen, you could. <laughs> I could stop sharing. Could be uh, also a browser issue or something like that. Um, So Philip, Philip, good question. Yeah, go ahead. You can, if you click on the magnifying glass icon, that's our search function. And then um, you could just, you could, you could just type in the user's name. It'll probably be sufficient to search for them. There's also some advanced commands. So you can type in like user colon, then the username to make sure you only bring them up. You could also search just by certain tags, for example. So you could say, say tag colon. And then if it's a one word tag, you could just type the word. If it's a two word tag, you're going to want to put it in quotes. Um, but th there's some search functionality in there so that you could isolate exactly what you want to look at. Um, yeah, you're welcome. And also in the LMS integration, um, in the LMS integration, the gradebook functionality actually provides a way to isolate and just look at a particular student's annotations as well. That's not available in the, in the wild version that we're using here. For, for for family, just one, one thing would be, um, you've probably seen this, but you can obviously close the sidebar, the little eyeball icon can turn off all highlighting. So if you do want to view a piece without seeing, like interacting with Hypothesis, you can do all that and still have Hypothesis activated. Obviously, if you're using the Chrome extension, you could just deactivate Hypothesis. In the LMS app, you could still close the sidebar, turn off highlighting by clicking on the eyeball icon to get your kind of read without other people's comments and then turn the components back on that you think will be helpful to you. One thing that I do a lot uh, that I'm doing right now uh, on, uh, on Kathleen's article is um, I'm linking to uh, another article, but I am linking to it. Uh, I'm going to, use the link to the special annotatable version of it <laughs> um, rather than just linking to the article directly. And what that will do is it will mean that um, that my link actually then provides a link not just to another article but to annotations on another article. And so this way you can kind of provide ways to, for people to kind of keep the conversation going across different documents. 
uh, uh June is asking, is that the number under each eared page icon for a new post? You mean these little numbers down here? Okay. Yeah. So these, Michael, what, do we have a good name for these little uh, icons that have the numbers? I, I forget what we call them. <laughs> Sorry, I was typing. Which which ones? You know the little. Uh, oh yeah. No, I have icons. no idea. I mean, we probably have a super clever name. Just come up with your own really clever name and assume we made it up. Yeah, and so those those icons are to indicate um, that you know the how many annotations there are in the area. So you'll see. Uh, they're kind of like navigation guideposts. That's very neat. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to, uh, if people want to talk, you can unmute your mic and, and talk. I thought I was unmuted all the times, but I told myself. <laughs> Got it. So you'll see there's a numbered icon here at the bottom, 22, and that's saying there are 22 more notes below where I am now. Yeah. So that's it's just another was sorting, number. Yeah. It's another way to know. It looks like my number is different to your number, which does it mean that I read some of the post and you didn't, or? No, it could mean that you're in a different location in the document. It could also mean that there are new annotations that you haven't, uh, you haven't updated yet. It could be that you've got it sorted by a different, in a different way. Oh, okay. I almost always um, use the default mode where, um, oops, where. Uh, I don't know why, but I have a different number, so I was wondered. Yeah, it's not like like Michael was saying; it's not dynamically figuring out if you read it or something. Okay, and also uh, the number forty-seven next to the annotations at the top bar is yeah. forty-seven. Is all annotation numbers on this text? It's all the um, top level annotations, if you will, okay. but not necessarily the replies. You can see in my um, Chrome extension sidebar, there's actually 63. So there are 47 kind of, you know, root annotations, but then there are replies to some of those, like here, mm -hmm. you can see the first one here. And so that 47 number counts up the number of annotations, but not the number of replies. Okay, what's the, what's the page notes for? Page notes are to add a note that isn't linked to any particular piece of text on the page, but just an overall note. Is that only for, uh, I can see myself or I can show to everybody? Is it public? Um, like with all annotations, you have the ability to decide what level of um, sort of uh, publicity <laughs> you want. So right now, I would, if I posted a page note here, I would be posting it fully publicly but I could toggle it to be only me and then it would be private to myself. And that's a functionality that's available on every note, right? And so I'll go back to this one that I made earlier where I can, I can edit it, right? And I can decide, you know what? I don't wanna make that public. I can toggle it to be only me. Okay. And then you won't be able to see it anymore. But I do want it to be public, so I'm gonna go back and change it. So I can make my, my self note. Yes. Okay. And just the highlights are going to be private by default, right? So if you just use the highlight button, mm -hmm. that would be private. It's just a highlight for you. If you actually want to make a note, then you have the choice of whether to make that visible to the group you're in. And here we're working in a fully public group mm -hmm. or private only to yourself. Mm -hmm. In the LMS environment, you're working always in the context of a private group that's just where the annotations are just visible to the members of the class, you can always also make the notes private only to you. So you can do both. You can share with the whole class or you can just make it private to yourself, but they're not public to the world inside the LMS environment. I like that. So it's funny, I'm, I'm reading, reading Kathleen's introduction here too, and I'm just getting sadder and sadder because I feel like uh, it's such a great uh, reflection of, of what we're seeing, seeing happen now in the world where uh, I feel, and maybe this is just me because I am a humanities person, but I feel like so much of what is going wrong is because of a lack of wider sets of uh, kind of cultural understanding 
in the world and to use this as a moment to decrease the amount of cultural understanding we're trying to bring to people through education seems like a, the wrong move, which is why the, the move in Australia give, causes me con some concern. I have one more question, sorry. Sure. Okay, um, if I have so many, you know, posts on the notation, is, it, is there any way I can see only a post to reply my, you know, reply to my uh, posted uh, things? Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Like, if I have a five uh, highlighted annotation, and then I am waiting for the reply to my post, and but I wanna, I don't wanna see you know one by one click the replies, and is that any way I can only see my own annotated one, somebody to reply to my annotated one? Uh, yeah, so, so a couple things here. Just so, so notice that the icon is red now. That means there are new annotations. So I'm going to hit that and that will load more annotations of somebody else annotated on the page. Mm -hmm. um, you may have missed this before, um, but oh, uh, so this is all in the wild, right? We're, n we're not in the LMS context here, but um, this search annotations uh, field, um, if you wanted to just see like uh, KD25's annotations, User colon KD25, and there's only one, mm -hmm. but that would filter all the annotations so that there was just KD25's annotations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you could see uh, uh, that there, if there were replies on those, on Katie's annotations. Does okay. that get it, what you were asking? Yes, yes. Yeah, Alan got it. Yeah, and if other people have other kind of detailed questions uh, too, that's great. One other thing that I'll show you about the in the wild experience is, you know, we're, we've just been in the context of a single document here, annotating it together. But um, this isn't enabled in the LMS version, but in the, when you're annotating in the wild, if I go up and click on my username on the little person icon here, that will actually open up I opened it in a new tab. Um, that will open up um, what we call the activity or profile view. And what this is, is this is a kind of browse and search view of all annotations, right? And so in this case, I'm looking, I've got that filtered to look at all my own annotations. And so you can see I have, you know, almost 1500, but across all documents and across all time. And so this is sort of a notebook of all the annotations that I've ever made. And so um, uh, you can also open this annotations here and say, oh, you know what? I would like to get back to this document. And so I can use this view annotation in context and it serves as a bookmark back to the document where I made the annotation. This is a really interesting article um, by Mahabali about uh, about literacies that teachers need during, during this pandemic. Um, and you'll see that it took a minute, but it opened up the document again exactly to my annotation on it. And so this, this view is of all the annotations that I've ever made. Um, and I can actually, if I toggle myself off, I'm seeing all the public annotations in the world. <laughs> um, and this search, uh, shows you different ways that you can filter. So if I wanted to see all the annotations on a particular document, all the annotations with a particular tag, and you're only gonna be able to see uh, annotations that you have the ability to see, right? You're not gonna be able to see private annotations that somebody made or annotations in a private group that you don't belong to. But here I've searched for all the annotations that I can see that are either public or in my groups or that I have my, myself have made that are tagged with COVID. And so you can see there's 2000 and I could, uh, you know, actually uh, go in and see both the annotation and go visit the document um, that it was made on. So as I was mentioning before, way back in the demo part of the experience, um, the in the wild experience and the LMS experiment, experience are pretty different right now, right? Um, 
the LMS experience is much more kind of, um, I don't want to say closed, but much more controlled in the sense that, you know, everybody's annotating privately together in, in a private group inside the, the class context on a reading that's been actually enabled with the annotation inside the LMS. And so there isn't this ability to kind of toggle back and forth out to the, the larger world of annotations in the public web. Uh, it doesn't prevent you from going to the public web, obviously, if you want to as a user, but um, the annotations from the LMS don't travel out to the public web in that way. We are, it is our goal to eventually bring these two experiences together so that people who want to have that highly scaffolded experience inside the LMS can, can do that and at least start with that. But then at the same time, enable it so that people can toggle out to a wider experience, maybe even working in public if that makes sense and so forth, using it for readings that haven't been assigned and, and so on just as a research tool for themselves. So that is part of uh, what we plan to do. It's just not there yet um, because we wanted to make sure that the, uh, that the LMS experience was providing that kind of scaffolded experience first. That was our first goal. Um, we've done a couple of different things in the in the LMS environment and we've been trying to burble them out to all the different LMSs. So um, one thing that we've done is we paid a lot of attention to accessibility. Um, we just got independently certified for being WCAG AA level 2.0 compliant um, and our next goal is to be level 2.1 compliant. Um, you can read all about this on the um, Hypothesis website. Uh, I'll just put a link there, but we take um, take accessibility pretty seriously, um, and we work with the uh, Inclusive Design Resource Center up uh, a research center up in uh, in Toronto, which you guys um, probably know too, because they uh, folks there uh, like you to have been a long part of the the Aperio and Sakai communities. Um, also, you, you might read on our blog that um, we just released uh, capability um, in Canvas first, but it is something that we were going to next work to roll out in the um, in the other uh, LMSs like Sakai. And this is to um, be able to break the private experience inside LMSs into sections so that there can be kind of more controlled reading experiences. And I think you know, both Lucy and Richard kind of pointed at this a little bit in their conversation. Um, so we did it in Canvas first, because actually Canvas's API made it kind of easier to do. Now that we've done it there once though, we think we'll be able to spread it to the other LMSs um, in pretty quick work. We found that with the gradebook integration. We did gradebook integration first with Canvas, but then we were able to uh, make it possible in any LTI compliant LMS as the next step because we'd done that preliminary work. So I apologize that we don't make Sakai our first, our first LMS um, because uh, there's a lot of great uh, developer, you know, affordances in Sakai as well. Um, but it's just been easier to get things done first in Canvas and then spread them out um, as things move on. I'll put a link to this here in the chat too. Um, if you are interested in kind of staying up to date with news from Hypothesis, um, feel free on the bottom of every page, there's a place where you can kind of subscribe, which means you'll be getting emails from us. Not very often, we don't, we don't send out a billion emails, but every time something new happens, like uh, this ability to annotate in sections or if we're holding a, a learning experience or something like that, we email folks who subscribe to let them know what's going on. Yeah, hey, th thank you, Richard. We're really, <laughs> we're really happy about the Sky integration too. It's, um, it's really near and dear to my heart as a, as an erstwhile Sky community member, um, and of course, Sakai uh, has some very special uh, kind of capabilities that a lot of other LMSs don't have, and it's really interesting to work with it. I mean, obviously, LTI integration in Sakai was has been early and robust. Um, and there's another thing that I wanted to mention to you guys too that might be interesting for you to explore in your context. In the Moodle environment, it's actually fairly easy to give students different privileges. And I know that that is somewhat configurable, well, very configurable in Sakai as well, although it could be kind of complex. And so if you think about the way that uh, Hypothesis LTI tool is uh, sort of 
engineered to work with Sakai by default. It's really uh, the idea of an instructor, you know, making a reading assignment and giving it to the students that has annotation enabled on it. But um, a lot of times it's sort of interesting to have students provide readings and select readings that then people might annotate together, like the class might annotate together. And in Moodle, it's relatively easy for an instructor to give students the right in a controlled area to actually be able to post things. And so perhaps um, it, for people who wanted to do this, you could um, adjust the permissions in the lessons tool, for example, so that students themselves would have the ability to add annotatable readings. Um, and that brings up a whole new possibility, right, where the instructor isn't selecting the readings, but the students are. Yeah, Richard, I'm, I'm glad you caught on to that because, you know, we've been saying for a while um, that, uh, that that was really probably something that was only possible in Moodle. But when I stop to think about it, it's, it should be completely possible in the Sakai context as well. I think, you know, for the, the proprietary systems like Blackboard and Canvas and, and D2L, things are a little bit more locked down and it's harder to spread permissions around like that, but the open systems do make it easier. I, I haven't myself tried that, but um, working with your very able Sakai administrators at your school, um, I saw, uh, I saw that Stephen Markarn was uh, in the room before. Uh, I'm not sure if he's still around, um, but they could probably help you figure out how to adjust um, permissions that way. Yeah, so Alyssa brings up student, uh, student content pages. Yeah, so something like that. I think that's worth an experiment. Um, I myself haven't tried it, and given how my demoing has gone so far today, I'm afraid to even open the door to that. At any rate, I see that we're getting really close to the, um, the end of our time together here. Um, so I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen and go back to the view of everybody's, everybody's uh, face, although I seem to be the only one still on video, which I can understand. But I really uh, I want to thank you all, not only for coming, but also for <laughs> sticking with us for so long. Um, still seeing uh, a lot of folks that I've known before, like, hello, Janice, um, and, uh, and new friends, too. I'm so glad to uh, have had a chance to, to meet with you all. Um, if there are anything, if there's anything else that you'd like to ask or um, talk about in the last couple of minutes, or oh, last one minute here, happy to do it. Otherwise, um, I really appreciate your coming. We will get the recording, uh, you know, set up and shared. Uh, and um, I also uh, do invite everyone to subscribe to News from Hypothesis because we are actually going to be um, uh, launching a couple of really interesting new projects around the collections of um, practices around annotation and a bibliography of annotation research. So we're looking forward to people being able to contribute to those and, and explore them and share them. Hello, Nate. This is Janice. Good to hear your voice. Janice, so good to hear your voice. I've heard it several times here and I've been kind of like chasing you around the conference, uh, trying to intersect with you. Really, really happy to see you, my old friend. Got a, probably a dumb question at this point. I missed the info in the session for it. Uh, Chrome is the only browser it works with right now? No, Chrome is just the only browser where there's a dedicated extension. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, if there's a couple different ways to get hypothesis. And so if, for instance, it's embedded in an LMS like Sakai, yeah. it doesn't matter. Any modern browser will be able to handle it because the LMS is providing the hypothesis integration. But if we're just trying it on our own from our own <clears throat> computer, better to go through Chrome? Uh, it, it makes it a little handier. There is one other thing that you can do uh, that makes it super easy. If you go to the Hypothesis website, there's a paste the link uh, menu function. I can show it to you really quickly here um, uh, at the very top. And if you go to that uh, and just paste, uh, you see this paste ah, the link menu item here? Thank you. That opens a little window. And you can paste any URL in there. So like I could go grab that article that we were um, working on before from Kathleen. And if I pasted it inside this paste the link function and hit annotate, it will take me to a view of that article with annotation enabled. And I could do that in any browser, any modern browser. <laughs> 
So, but you need to be logged into Hypothesis at the same time, right? Well, you would only need to be logged in in order to make annotations. You could read public annotations without being logged in. So all that does, I don't know why it's taking so long to load, but all that does is it just takes me to, in this case, Kathleen's blog um, with the hypothesis sidebar enabled. Um, my internet seems to be chewing on being able to load that page right now. Maybe so I, got you, I, I got momentarily distracted by an order I was putting in, but um, <clears throat> you put in the link to the article you want to uh, annotate, the website you want to annotate. Yeah, so I go to the hypothesis, any page on the hypothesis website, right. there's a paste the link Got it. item here. And you just, once you open that, sorry, it keeps bouncing around here. Once you open that paste the link, it opens this little form and you can just put any URL in there and hit go and it will take you to that article with annotation enabled. There we go. Uh, so it'll take just a second for the annotation to come up. Cool, thank That's, you. So you could do that in Firefox or Safari or It's just a little easier in Chrome because I've got the extension here already and I could just hit this button and it would just automatically load. Right, up. I've set up Chrome already, but I didn't, I usually use Firefox being an open source person. Yeah, me too. Me too. Also, you can, you can also embed, uh, you can embed uh, hypothesis in, in a website itself. So for instance, I have my blog on WordPress and I, there's actually a WordPress plugin for hypothesis. And so I have hypothesis on every page of my blog, just oh. already built in and waiting. So anyone who comes to my website, like has it automatically, um, be, regardless of their browser, because I have it embedded. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, sure, that was an extra little bonus, uh, bonus question in session. Any other last minute questions? I don't want to keep anybody here. I know you all have busy days that you want to get to. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.